Hey, we get it. You don't want to be hearing a progressive commercial right now. So let us tell you something you do want to hear. You are powerful. You're a warrior who bathes in your enemy's tears. Then you step out of that refreshing tear bath and into a bathrobe that somehow looks good on you. Yeah, you can pull off a robe. There. Don't you feel better? You'll also feel better when you save money for driving safely with Snapshot from Progressive. Mmm, savings you can use to buy more robes. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California, North Carolina, or from all agents. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. to Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 199, and this week I am pleased to be joined by a returning guest. Hello, Gerard. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for having me on after this long and arduous week of watching pro wrestling. Yeah, it's a lot of shows. I mean, that's that's basically, I don't know if we have time for any banter or anything other than... Uh... Well, <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll just say, like, I watched... Well, I watched everything for the show, but I also watched like Impact and AEW, which I don't always do every week, but I did this week because I wanted to see the main events and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, di- yeah. I didn't I didn't watch Impact. I did watch AEW, um, which probably was the best episode of Dynamite for me at least since like the very early days. Um, you know, just a, an awesome main event on that Dynamite episode, and then some other good stuff too. But you know, I I don't watch that show every week, and the the running joke. Um, you know, became that like every time I put that show on and watch the full show, like the show would be pretty horrible. Like even people who normally like it would admit that like, yeah, for some reason, John, you always seem to watch the week that sucks. Like the last one I watched was that week with, uh, Kenny Omega and Joey Janela as the main event where they brought out like 500 new acts and they were all pretty green and terrible. Uh, it was like December something, mid-December. And I think even people who like the show usually would admit that that episode was pretty bad. But that basically sums up every time I turn it on. It's like, I always seem to turn it on for a terrible week. But, uh, you know, they they had a good week this week for sure. So, finally, the curse was broken. The the streak of uh, me watching terrible shows. It was all Kenta. But yeah, so I guess that's our mini Dynamite review. Obviously, we don't have time to get into much more detail. Uh, but yeah, it's all the news swirling around the Forbidden Door. And, you know, Finn Juice are going to show up and impact now and i mean i really i have to be honest like i'm fine with new japan working with aw i guess especially you know new japan guys showing up on dynamite and giving me a reason to watch i don't fucking need new japan guys showing up on fucking impact i'm like i i, I really don't want to watch that show so like well it, it, <laughs> i feel bad for saying this but finn juice have lost all of their momentum and now this happens yeah it feels like a punishment, honestly. It's like going to impact. Well, I mean, given uh, Juice's uh, last experience in an American promotion, uh, in his uh, brief ROH run, yeah, it could certainly uh, be seen as that. So I don't know. I mean, I guess well, I'm I'm not gonna watch Impact. I've decided I'm just gonna like whatever Finn Juice does. I'm sure it'll be on YouTube or something. But I I'm not watching Impact for that. But yeah, I mean, obviously. You know, Dave Meltzer's saying there's rumors of Okada going to a going. Actually, he didn't say he didn't say which promotion. It could be either one, I guess. Uh, it could be Okada and Impact, which would be funny on a number of levels, you know. But yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it is very, very strange. 
All right, so we had a few uh, little technical difficulties there, so I'm not sure if this is a transition that makes a lot of sense or not, uh, but we're back here to uh, discuss the Noah show, the first of three shows we have to discuss here. Uh, but yeah, hopefully no more technical difficulties as we go here, because we have a lot of shows to cover. I think I just said three shows. It's actually four shows from three promotions, but, you know, should be, uh, you know, a lot of fun, I think, and a lot of stuff, to, even though it's a lot of stuff to get through. You know, we, we talked a little bit about the Forbidden Door stuff, you know, I think the conclusion was, you know, I'm going to watch Dynamite, I'm not going to watch Impact, I guess, uh, you know, but, oh, I think the last thing I said was, like, Okada, you know, the rumor going around now is, you know, Dave Meltzer is saying Okada is going to be involved somehow, which, you know, that, who, I, I want, he didn't say when, I mean, he didn't even say which promotion, I assume it's going to be AEW, because, like, Okada going to Impact sounds insane to me, maybe, maybe they're going to do it, but, like, I mean, the guy, the guy clearly hates that company, or, you know, or going all the way back, so, I mean, you should, have, have you ever seen his answer at, a? when he was asked that after the, after the G1 Dallas show. Uh, no, I haven't actually. <laughs> it was a pretty crazy reaction where he just did not want to, he clearly did not want to answer the question. He was clearly even like kind of annoyed that it was asked. I mean, just, he does not have fond memories of that TNA impact run. Uh, but yeah, who knows he could show up in impact. I think it's more likely he shows up to AEW to do something with Kenny or something. Uh, but I guess we will see. In the meantime, though, uh, obviously, we're here to talk about four different Puro shows from three different companies, like I mentioned. Uh, my thoughts here are going to be really all over the place. I mean, I, two of these shows I really liked, two of these shows I really hated. Uh, and we'll talk about which ones uh, as we get into it. And, you know, from talking to you before the show, I think your thoughts are going to be a little more even keel probably than mine. But yeah, we're going to start out here with the Noah show, uh, because I think that was the, the big show of the week here. The Noah Destination 2021 Back to Budokan. Uh, it took place on Friday, February 12th, of course, at the Nippon Budokan. Uh, I watched this on Fight TV for the first time. Most, mostly just wanted to check out what the English commentary was like. Uh, it, you know, and also because like half like half the card was weirdly not available on Abima, which uh, we, 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 talked about that. we talked about that already. It was a very weird situation. But yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the one thing I will say, the audio mixing could be a little better. You know, the announcer's just sound very loud compared to the noise in the arena. But the video quality, I will say, though, is way better than watching it on the Abima stream, like on my computer hooked up to my TV, like using the Fight app on Roku. Like the video quality looks really good. So I may, like, I, I think better than like New Japan World, honestly. Uh, maybe not not as good as New Japan looks on Roku, as I, you know, the, the Roku channel thing that, uh, that rolled out this past week. Because man, the video quality on that was amazing. And I'm sure it probably looks similar to what the Axis uh, video quality looked like if you had a really good, you know, a nice 4K TV with an upscaler back then. But I didn't. So this was like, you know, I mean, the upscaler can't do anything with uh, that barely 720p New Japan World shit. But man, it did a great job with the Roku channel footage, which is just, you know, it looks amazing on my TV. So, you know, even if you were one of these people who was going to hand wave the Roku channel stuff because it's pretty old. Which, you know, I kind of was too, I think, you know. But, like, uh, it, it looks so... Like, if you have a nice TV, it looks so good that it might be worth going back to watch just for that reason. I mean, when they get up to Okada Naito from last year's Wrestle Kingdom, I'm definitely going to watch it, you know, in that video quality. But, yeah, this this uh, Noah Fight TV feed, somewhere between, uh, you know, the New Japan World and the Roku Channel New Japan stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, I like the commentary for the most part. The one thing, it would be nice if they translated the Abima meters when they came on screen instead of just ignoring them. Uh, you know, they clearly can speak Japanese or something. Maybe they just can't read it as well or something. But yeah, I mean, like, I can read Katakana. Most viewers on Fight TV, I'm sure, can't. And some of the kanji ones can stump me. So, like, it would be nice if they, you know, just translated those Abima meters instead of just ignoring them. Um... They also kept saying, so they, they get, this confused me at first. They kept saying it had been 11 years since Noah had last run the Budokan. My first thought was that's wrong because, you know, there was the Kenta Kobashi retirement show on May 11th, 2013. So that's actually slightly less than eight years. But then Go says the same thing. Go Shiozaki says the same thing in his promo video. So I realized I, I just don't think they're counting the Kobashi retirement show. They're counting that as like a, you know, special Kobashi show instead of a Noah show. 
even though it was clearly promoted by like if you if it's in the you know if you go to Noah on Cage match, you know it's in the Noah events, but they're counting that as a special show, and they're counting their last show at the Budokan then as uh, December fifth, twenty ten, I guess, which was headlined by Takashi Sugera defeating Takashi Morishima uh, to retain the GHC Heavyweight Title. In case you're wondering. But, you know, that's still more like 10 years and two months than 11 years. But sure, twenty at least it was 2010. I, I at least get what they were talking about now. Well, when that Kobashi retirement show happened, I, I, Kobashi had like a barely even a relationship with what was left of Noah. Because oh, yeah, that's a good Burning, point. Burning had just left yeah. and they had and that was over them releasing Kobashi from his contract. But they agreed to do the retirement show. So I think that's sort of like the dark period that no one really wants to talk about. Right. That's a good I totally forgot about that. That's a good point. So there you go. That's probably why. Uh, so we'll start at the main events here for all these shows and work our way down just because, you know, with four shows to talk about here, we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about undercard tags. That is for sure. Uh, but of course, the big the big main event here, the big news of the entire show, Keiji Muto defeats Go Shiozaki. 29-32 with the Frankensteiner. He becomes the 34th GHC heavyweight champion. Uh, becomes the third man to capture the IWGP, GHC, and Triple Crown titles. Now, I can think of Kensuke Sasaki immediately as one of them. Who's the other one? Takayama. Oh, duh, you're right. Yep, you're sure Takayama. And also, like, let's give some props to Mudo, Mudo because he's also a former NWA World Heavyweight Champion. That's true. Which I think he's the only one that's won all four of those. Yeah, because neither of those guys had definitely held that. But yeah, Ken, like when I when they said two people have held it prior, like you know, Ken Sasaki came to my mind immediately. But the other one, I'm like, who the fuck is the other guy? But yeah, obviously it would be Takayama. That makes sense. Hey, Takayama also held the NWF title. Very very prestigious. Yes, that's true. <laughs> He's only got to hold all four of those. But yeah, I mean, okay. So before we talk about the match quality, the, the elephant in the room obviously here is Mudo be, beating Go, which, uh, you know, the takes on this seem to vary wildly, to say the least. Some people are very happy about it. Some people are very upset about it. Some people think it's very stupid. Um, I will say, if you went on, like, Japanese wrestling fan Twitter... Uh, and seeing these Japanese tweets, like the the overwhelming majority of tweets I saw before the title win were very supportive of Mudo winning here, just out of the general feeling that he deserved to have that, you know, the uh, the accomplishment of winning all three of the top men's titles in Japan, um, you know, from the traditional big three. Uh, I, you know, people did think he deserved that, and people did kind of rally behind him to win that. So it's not like, you know, I ha if there's some huge backlash in Japan, I have not seen it. Maybe it's out there and I just haven't seen the tweets. But, uh, you know, people seem very supportive of it. The um, the other part, you know, uh, you know to, to this is, like, people are saying, I guess, like, it's very upsetting to see Go Shiozaki's big epic title win and – or title reign – and with a 58 year old man beating him and blah blah blah, I don't I don't really agree with that because I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not like Keiji Mudo is beating a young guy here to end their big title. I mean, Go Shizaki is almost Go Shizaki is almost 40 years old. I mean, this is not a spring chicken uh, on his own. Okay, so that's first of all. I mean, this is not uh, Mudo cutting out the legs out from under a 28 year old champion. I mean, this is a a man who is who had an amazing run here. But, I mean, he's pushing 40 himself. It's a, it's a little different than if he beat Kaito to end his title reign. I mean, he did beat Kaito, but Kaito's probably going to beat him now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so that's one. Two, you know, the other thing I saw is, like, well, what's the point of the Go Shiozaki reign if you're not going to use it to put over somebody, you know, uh, some young guy or whatever? I mean, the point of the Go Shiozaki reign is, first of all, to have an amazing Go Shiozaki title reign that rebuilt the standing of this company. I mean, at the end of the year uh, of 2020, Tokyo Sports was running headlines like, uh, you know, New Japan, more popular, but Noah fans more satisfied. It was like the basic translation where they're pointing out that, you know, even though more people like New Japan, the or more people watch New Japan, the Noah shows uh, were like getting higher ratings on like, you know, the Japanese equivalent of Cage Match. And that kind of thing was not happening prior to 2020 and prior to this Go Shiozaki title reign. So, you know, the, the, the title reign itself 
like the rain was the point. It's like that's my argument here. Like you don't always have to have an angle of like putting over, you know, whoever the fuck. You know, the ang- the rain itself can be the point here. And the point was it rebuilt the standing of the company and it rebuilt Goshi Ozaki. Because it's not like Goshi Ozaki before this title reign was, you know, some universally revered legend. He had never had a run like this. He had gotten his, you know, fucking dick cut off every time he was about to get a run like this. I mean, we talked about this on the show before that All Japan run when he won the Triple Crown when I, when, from Joe Doring in that awesome match. Where I was like, okay, they're going with Goshi Ozaki. Here we go. And then he loses to, like, Akibodo in, like, four months, I think. And it's like, you know, just... That's, like, almost the story of his career. He never got the big signature run. And, you know, he's pushing 40. He's running out of time. Like, he has the big signature run now. He, he held the belt for, you know, 13 months. He had these, you know, these legendary title matches. He rebuilt interest in this company. And for the rest of his career now... He's going to be a bigger deal, and it's going to be a bigger deal when he challenges people. Like, you know, he might challenge Kaito later this year after uh, Kaito presumably beats Muto. You know, it'll be a bigger deal if he gets the belt back. He'll just It'll just be a bigger deal to beat him in general. I mean, he he just has a increased standing in this company now. Um, so it's just a very, uh, it, it's a very different... You know, it's a very, it, it's a big deal just to establish him. It doesn't always have to be about establishing the guy that he loses to. And the third point I want to make about that is I don't think people who think Go should have put over Kaito for the belt, which is the argument I've heard, are thinking that th- think really thinking that through. Like, if you want Kaito Kiyomiya to be a heel in the short run, that's a great way to do it. Because you, do, you generally do not want to have your top baby face, who's beloved by the fans, you know, I am Noah, all that stuff... You don't want that guy to lose to the guy to, to the guy you're trying to put over as the next top baby face. I mean, that's not generally how it's done, especially in Japanese wrestling. I mean, you know, when Okada beat Tanahashi, you know, the first time and really the first few times, he was a heel. Like, eventually he did turn baby face, but it took like three years. And, you know, it, the Tanahashi fans resented him for beating Tanahashi to ending that epic reign and, you know, the 2011 reign. And, you know, just and beating him. Like, that. The, the Tanahashi fans absolutely resented him. He was a heel in that feud. Uh, you know, when Kento Kobashi's big reign ended, you know, they went with Takashi Rikio, who instead of, you know, like a guy like Morishima, who they really, uh, I think, wanted to make the next guy. Like, Rikio was kind of like the guy they put in there as, like, you know, if he gets over, great. If he doesn't, whatever. Because they knew that the fans were going to resent whoever beats Kobashi. I mean, that might be a generous way of looking at the way Noah booked that. But that's, I mean, I just don't think that they ever thought, I don't know. I don't think they thought Takashi Rikio was going to be the long-term solution. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I, that's how I remember. Well, I don't know. I, I feel like the way he was sort of getting pushed and the fact that he was pushed over more shame for that position, I think so. I just don't think they realized what the result of him beating Kobashi was actually going to get out of the fans. Well, maybe that's the lesson then. I don't know. But like, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's a huge lesson. And, and maybe that like, is the really the smart booking here and a good example of why uh, this uh, Mudo thing could very well work out. And I think will. Yeah. I mean, the kite, like, like having Kaito beat go directly. It just, I don't know. It just, I, I don't like that. First of all, go beat Kaito to begin his reign. And it would feel a little weird just to have it go, you know, all the way back around again. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. It is very, it is very weird, but I mean, like, I, I don't really get why they're, you know, why I don't, I don't really get, I guess, like, why people think that would necessarily be a great, a great plan. It just doesn't, like, to have it go full back, right back to Kaito without any transition guy in between, I just think would, I, I think what you're going to end up with is the Go fans resenting, uh, resenting, <laughs> resenting Kaito Kiyomiya, which is not what you want when you're trying to make him the top baby face. Here, you know, Kaito can go beat Keiji Muto, can get his win back from when Keiji Muto beat him, and, you know, he beats this, the, the the legend and the outsider, and he wins the title. I mean, that just makes a lot more sense to me than having Kaito just beat Go. But, I don't know. I mean, you could have done something, somebody else, I guess, but I just, I, I don't really have a problem with the way they did it here. I, I, I take it by what you just said, uh, that uh, you don't really have a problem either. Uh, no, and I don't, well, and another reason why, like, um, okay, so we established why Kaito is a bad choice. So he's gone through everyone else, right? And you don't have access to foreigners, 
So, like, I'm not sure how much more you could have gotten out of this rain um, unless, you know, conditions were a little better, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I get, like, the knee-jerk reaction to be like, well, it's an old guy, blah, 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 and like, oh, compared to WWE and stuff. I mean, <laughs> if WWE, like, I saw people comparing it to, like, Goldberg and stuff. If Noah has, like, old people win every big main event or be in every big main event for the next decade... Then you can compare it to WWE. Like this is just not. It's not this. This is not remotely the same thing. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just being. Defensive. Well, one thing I think Noah's sort of doing that New Japan sort of didn't. If we sort of take the longer view of things, is, is I think they are sort of using the old guys more to try to jumpstart things. Where I think the New Japan like rise was a little slower and but steadier type thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad strategy from Noah, but I just think that's their strategy. Yeah, I mean, like, they, they definitely want to try to get more attention on themselves. I mean, look, you know, they're New Japan in, you know, 2011, 2012, um, they could probably more afford to take a long view and, like, take a, a patient view at rebuilding because, like, there was no company above them, right? Like, they're, you know, pro wrestling as a whole was very depressed then in Japan and there, there was no like 500 pound gorilla in the industry. Noah in this position, you know, there is a, a, a company that's very popular, you know, there is a company way above them and, you know, taking the patient approach is, can be good. But like, on the other hand, if you, if you're too patient, if you, you know, if you're like, in other words, they have to do something to get some eyeballs on them. And they have, they do have a competitor that has all, all all the eyeballs on them right now. Maybe you just think the Mudo thing is embarrassing or whatever. I get that perspective, I guess. Although I thought he uh, held his own here about as well as a fifty-eight-year-old man with no knees could hold his own, as we'll talk about in the match. But like, yeah, I don't like they have to do something to get those eyeballs. I mean, the 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 the, the, the promotion's good, the matches are great, you know. There's and they're trying in a lot of ways, on the other hand, like, to be the anti-New Japan, to, like, really, you know, appeal to people who maybe aren't into what New Japan is doing right now. And it's not just for bringing in a legend like Mudo, when New Japan obviously does not book their older wrestlers to do much of anything. But, I mean, it's also bringing in, like, the shooter types that obviously New Japan does not mess with anymore. Uh, it's doing nothing but clean finishes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have to do something to stand out. I mean, you can't just... Uh, you know, they you have to get the eyeballs on you, and I think that's all. That's kind of what this is about too. And you know, if this Mudo thing goes on for like six months, and he's beaten everybody in the company, then I then I think it'll be you know something you can complain about. But I just don't see that happening. So I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts before we get into the actual match? Well, I mean, the fact that they had Kaido come out right at the end of the show kind of says like. This isn't going to be a long reign anyway. Well, they could have Mudo beat Kaido again. I see people saying that. I, I really doubt it. But no. <laughs> uh, anyway. But yeah, so this match, I thought this was awesome. I mean, you know, this was as good of a match as Go Shiozaki and a 58-year-old Keiji Mudo could have. I mean, you know, Mudo, obviously he can't. He can barely move in there. That's, you know, that's very obvious at, at certain points. But what he still has is... His in-ring charisma, his ability to draw you in and make you want to watch what he's going to do. And his timing is still really good when he's able to do the moves, you know? And they were able to create, like, a lot of drama. Like, watching this unspoiled, you know, I really had no idea who was going to win, even though I thought Mudo had a great chance going in. I mean, they really built this match in a way where it felt like either guy could win it and where it felt like even Go was favored for a while. Like, Go just started taking over. But yeah, I mean, Mudo, you know, goes after Go's legs, as, you, as you'd expect. Um, they tease, like, a, a ramp spot for old time's sake. Thankfully did not do that because Mudo's body would have probably exploded in the, into dust at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, they were, like, Go got, like, you know, surprisingly physical with him a few times. I mean, some of those chops that were, like, just redditing this man's chest. I was like, you know, I, please be careful, KG Mudo. That was basically my reaction. Uh but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the figure four stuff was good. Go selling as as it's been throughout this entire reign was phenomenal. Um, you know, Go hits like a really big lariat at one point uh, on the, you know, the old man Mudo after the one of the Shining Wizards in the corner. 
uh, you know, very, again, probably harder than you'd like to see, if anything. Uh, and, you know, Mundo kicked out the Guild Flasher. Uh, and then we get, like, three Shining Wizards around the 25-minute call. Go kicks out at two, um, which really got a surprise reaction on the crowd. I guess I thought that was it. Uh, and they really, like, yeah, they go into a great, um, you know, closing stretch. I mean, there were two botches down the stretch, which, you know, uh, the Emerald Flosion, um, you know, the, Mudo tried it the first time, and he just couldn't quite get him up, and just, like, they both collapsed. Sad little botch there. You know, you can't, you have to take points off for that, I think. But, you know, he they repeated the spot, which I never loved, but here the crowd loved him doing that move. And, like, he pointed up at the heavens at Misawa as he tried to cover uh, but go kicked out too. That I mean, I thought that was going to be the finish for a second, and you know the big go kick out there was pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, the Mudo like tries to go for the, like Tease is going for the moon salt. The crowd can't believe it, uh, and but then decides better ever when Go's getting back up behind him, and then uh, Go like basically gets Mudo on the second turnbuckle. This was a botch too, but this botch ruled. Because he was going for, like, the Go Flasher or, like, a Brain Buster off there or something. He slips on the second turnbuckle, but, like, drops Mudo on his fucking head. Uh, you know, the landing, I'm sure, for Go didn't, you know, didn't uh, didn't look good. But, like, this ends up being, like, the Go, the Avalanche Go Flasher 21 or something. Like, one of these Japanese wrestling botches that, like, ends up just being, like, a sick head drop. So, you know, it just kind of works in the drama of the match. Uh, but, yeah, Go... You know, Go went with the Misawa rolling elbow, did the running elbow, and then the short arm lariat, but Mudo kicked out. And then Go slammed him and moonsaulted him, which I thought for sure was the finish, but Mudo kicked out a two again. This old man just can't be beaten. And then Go charges him with another lariat. Mudo doesn't even go down. He charges him for another lariat. Mudo counters with the with the Rana. Um, you know, people. People said this was botched. I didn't. I don't know. I didn't think this was like a, the worst run I've ever seen or anything. I thought like, it was sloppy, but I wouldn't call it a botch. Yeah, like a fifty-eight-year-old man pulling off uh, a Rana like that. Like I'm. I don't know. I don't really. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really. You know. I thought it was fine actually for what it was. You know. Again, for the for this for this guy doing this Rana. I mean, it could have been a lot worse, honestly. Uh, and that was the pen, which I. You know, that was a shocking pen. Um, you know, I, I screamed, honestly, <laughs> like, you know, it was just a, just an awesome finish, I think, uh, you know, out of nowhere. It didn't really make Go look weak or anything because, you know, it was more like he just got caught with this surprise Rana pin. But yeah, I thought this was awesome. I went four and a quarter. Might be high, given the couple of prominent botches, but at the end of the day, I just loved the match. I just had so much fun with it. Uh, you know, I especially loved the finish. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how they pulled off a nearly 30 minute match this good. But Go Shiozaki is a god at this point, and Keiji Muto just, he made it work. I mean, he tried, th- things were a little rough at times, but I thought they pulled this out of the fire every time. I, you know, I thought it was going to fall apart, and, you know, I, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I'd go four and a quarter, too. Uh, it was sort of, like, terrifying to watch at points, not just for the botches, but there was a couple of times that, Mudo just looked like he was going to collapse out of exhaustion. <laughs> uh, he was gassed. I really, like, I could not believe they went 30 so minutes. So early. Yeah. I could not believe they, um, they tried to go 30 minutes. That's crazy. Yeah, and like, there was, I think, one point, like, when Mudo was, like, after the match, when Mudo was on the ramp with the belt walking back, I was like, he just looks like he's going to fall over on this ramp right now. <laughs> yeah. But, like, thankfully, he made it, and he seems to be okay. So, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I... Like, I don't know, I just think, like, when talking about the botches, I don't think a botch is necessarily an automatic, um, you got to subtract automatically from your rating or whatever, I guess in context or how it takes you out of the match and type things. And the botches here didn't really take me out of it. So, well, yeah. The, I mean, the, it was... the, the one off the turnbuckle added to it to me, at least. Right, yeah. yeah. No, that looked nasty and great, but, you know, whatever. Uh, given how Mudo, like, looked when he botched the emerald frozen the first time it didn't even look nearly as bad as say some like 20 year old kid slipping on a turnbuckle doing like a swan dive or something yeah well there you go awesome made event and like you said kaito came out to challenge mudo uh, i'm definitely there for that so very into what they're doing right now at the top of the card uh the semi main event for the ghc national title another legend here kano this time defeats Masakatsu Funaki in 10 minutes and 10 seconds 
with the Dragon Suplex hold. Uh, so he succeeds in his fifth title defense here. Uh, this was also awesome. I mean, obviously much shorter, but, uh, you know, I, I love this match. I mean, they start on the mat, unsurprisingly. Uh, you know, they were going through, like, Funaki trying to get through Kano's guard. Uh, Kano gets, uh, tries to get a triangle. Funaki gets his back. I mean, some really cool little mat wrestling stuff, you know, with Funaki getting the mount, and he started throwing these, like, mocking slaps to the face. Suddenly got a cross arm break out of nowhere, which sent Kano scrambling to the ropes. So it was all Funaki, pretty much for most of his match, honestly. Like, uh, you know, Kano got some offense in after that, but he missed a double stomp. And then Funaki, like, knocked him down with a single knee and then gets the hybrid blaster, his sick-ass uh, kneeling Michinoku driver. But then instead of covering, he decides to go straight into a sleeper hole, which was an interesting decision. Uh, and then Kano gets the ropes almost immediately. Uh, and then Funaki starts, like, rocking Kano with these hard kicks as Kano is in a kneeling position. And that leads to a 10-count knockout tease. Uh, Kano was doing this... I, I, look, look, I get that people... Some people don't like, Kano, don't like Kano. I really don't even understand why most of the time. But, like, he was awesome here. He was, like, selling by, like, holding his ear. Like, that, that like, Funaki had fucked his ear up with these kicks. Maybe he really had, for all I know. But I thought he was awesome here. Just, like, you know, selling the ear. Like, uh, you know, these my ear's all fucked up. And they trade these really hard palm strikes... Kano absolutely nails him with a high kick. Like, you could hear that one. And then delivers a dragon suplex hold for the pin out of nowhere. And I love that finish. I mean, Kano was getting his ass kicked, but just managed to get, like, one, like, solid high kick. It was a great kick, too, which it pretty much had to be. And then gets the dragon suplex hold and is able to follow up with that for the three count. And Funaki looks shocked afterward, which made sense. Uh, But then does give Kano the handshake anyway. But yeah, this is an easy four stars for me. I can't really go higher than that because it was it was pretty short. Uh, but I like the MMA grappling stuff a lot. The striking was awesome. Finish ruled. Easy four stars. Yeah, I'd go about four two. Uh, finish was perfect. Little shoot style finish. Like get in there, big kick, big suplex, and you got the win. So I like that sort of callback. Perfect for that. Perfect length. Although um, Funaki looks like he could probably last a little longer than Mudo yeah. without getting gassed, but you know he looked he looked pretty damn good here. And uh, honestly, uh, you know I think Funaki they can do things with in Noah going forward. Uh, yeah, I mean I would love to see him do some more stuff for sure. Uh, up next we had the uh, the big tag team match. Now, Kaito Kiyomiya and Yoshi- Yoshiki Inamura defeating Naomichi Marafuji and Jun Akiyama. Uh, Kaito pins Marafuji in 1812 with a Tiger Suplex hold. Again, the booking makes sense here since, uh, you know, Kaito was coming up out to challenge uh, the Keiji Mudo after the end there. But yeah, I thought this was a good match. Uh, I went three and a half stars on it. You know, it, it didn't like blow me away or anything. It never got to like an excellent level or anything like that, but I thought it was good. Uh, and Marafuji worked a little harder than he typically does these days. And, you know, Kaito took a good beating, as he almost always does, but just never never quite got to the next level for me. Uh, and then we got, like, an interesting little stare down with Kaito and Akiyama afterwards, but uh, Akiyama seemed to give him the seal of approval. And Kaito might have, like, teared up a little bit here before shaking hands with him. It, was, it looked very emotional. But, yeah, this was good. Uh, I think I like this more than you. I'd go like four. I thought the story was great, like with the uh, old guys trying to grind out the the young, the younger guys. Um, I thought Inamura looked awesome here. It was awesome to see him go against Akiyama. And uh, I will also say, poor Mara Fuji. He seems to have to be the job guy uh, now on all of the Noah Big shows because if you look back, there's seen he's done a lot of jobs on a lot of big Noah shows in the last couple of years mm, that's true yeah I guess that's just uh that's his role lately uh the match before that was for the GHC junior heavyweight title I haven't seen a lot of buzz for this one but I thought this was awesome uh Seki Yoshioka beats Daisuke Harada in 1058 with the crash driver uh and you know this was a you know I I thought like this was pretty much non-stop action from the opening bell all fast pace um you know there was one big spot where like there was this huge overhead uh, belly to belly from Harada to Yoshioka in the corner. And like, he really just like tossed him in there as hard as he could. Uh, and then Yoshioka's kicks 
were pretty brutal, which drew some like audible reactions from the crowd. And he drops Harada right on his head with that uh, the wacky wrist clubs driver, and then hits the crash driver for the pin, which I was stunned by. I did not expect him to win here. But he's your new Juju champion. This was awesome. Uh, I went four stars. I liked it even better than Hiromu's show, which uh, you'll find out shortly. I gave the same rating. But yeah, I thought this was a really, really fun uh, junior title match. Just an awesome sprint here. I thought this was awesome, too. Four stars. Uh, Harada is really underrated because whenever people talk about Noah Juniors, it's like as a punchline to a joke. And rightfully so sometimes, given the booking. But Harada's reign has been awesome, and it's like I think he's really underrated. Uh, yeah, and, and second- oh, and I I think Yoshioka is the first like post wrestle one dissolution guy to win a title anywhere. <laughs> That's kind of funny, actually. Yeah. Uh, then we have the GHC Junior Tag Team Titles. Uh, this time around, it was Ogawa and Hayata defeating Kotaro Suzuki and Akira Hodaka. Uh, Ogawa pins Kotaro on thirteen oh five. Uh, to make their third defense. This I didn't think was that great. Um, just was kind of all right for me. I mean, you know, it was Ogawa, like I say, pins Kotaro out of nowhere with a wacky cradle after what felt like some pretty meandering action. Just nothing great here at all. I went two and three quarters, you know, slightly above average, but, you know, I don't I don't know. I really, I don't like Hayata. I mean, that's always my thing is I never have really been into him. And this just really underwhelmed for me. Uh... Hayata might be the worst wrestler in a big Japanese company that isn't like a old guy, like in terms of someone that's supposedly been the prime uh, years of their career. Yeah, uh, I think he just sucks. Uh, so yeah, but I was like, I kind of had, but I still sort of had higher hopes for this match because of like Kadaka Suzuki. Like that's an amazing sounding team, and Ogawa has been great um, in all of these big matches. But yeah, it just didn't click. Uh, then we have so the the lower end of the car, which apparently you could not see for free on a Bema, but uh, you know I'm sure you could see it for free in other places. Uh, we had a 12 man tag: Sugira Goon, Tsukashi Sugira, Kazuchi Sakuraba, Kazuyuki Fujita, Kazunari Murakami, Kendo Kashin, and Osawa Rangai defeating Kongo, Katsuhiko Nakajima, Masaki Tamiya, Manabu Soya, Hao, Neo, and Tadasuke. Uh, Shigeru pins Neo in 1058 with an Olympic slam. Kind of pointless to have 12 guys here and only go 11 minutes. But, uh, you know, it was a wild brawl around ringside. Uh, you know, the, the highlight for me, at least, because I love the guy, was Murakami coming in the ring in his very shiny black suit. Like, he just stepped out of a Yakuza game and just punching everybody in the face. Uh, I, I just cannot imagine not loving that man. But, yeah, this was fun enough. But uh, I, I, I just I thought it would go longer. With 12 wrestlers in there, I was surprised it ended with under 11 minutes. Uh, you know, I went three stars. I enjoyed it for what it was, but, you know, it's nothing you got to go out of way to say. Yeah, I mean, these, like, huge con- Congo or, like, Segura gun tags are, are okay, I guess. Nothing much. A lot of smalls. Yeah, the Murakami punches were the uh, best part. Um, uh, I'm over Fujita, and I have been for a while. But uh, I guess we should also mention... Kendo Caution challenged Kendo. Mm, yeah, I totally forgot after. about that. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that'll that be interesting, at least, for sure. Uh, not who I would expect to challenge the national title, but that'll be that'll be something. Uh, if anyone can get something decent out of him in 2021, it's Kendo. Yeah. Match number three, Masaki Mochizuki and Masao Tanaka beat Mohamed Yone and Shue Tanaguchi. Uh, Tanaka pins Yone with the sliding D in only 658. Uh, this was just too short. Uh, to really say it was anything super great or anything, but it was fast-paced uh, while it lasted. And, you know, Mochizuki and Tanaka can, of course, both still go, given they're old guys and everything. But, you know, three stars. Again, very inessential, but fun while it lasted. Uh, this was my favorite match of the uh, undercard, yeah, actually. for sure. Uh, you know, and uh, I guess Yone Taniguchi is a regular team now, which... I guess is fine. Although I still think you could use Taniguchi like as the tag team partner of um, a like a bigger name. I agree. I, I, I don't think he needs to be put in like the Quiet Storm role or something. Yeah, you know? he's really he's, uh, still, he could, he's still he pretty could good. still be like the number two to someone. I think he's still pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's just very bizarre to me that he's like in this very low card role. But uh, match number two 
was in the eight, six man tag, uh, the team of Atsushi Kotoge, uh, Daiki Inaba. Speaking of X Russell One guys not doing anything, and <laughs> Yasutaka Yano, a young boy, beating Haj- Hajime Ohara, Yohei, and another young boy, uh, Kawe Fujimura. Uh, Kotoge pins Fujimura in 7:52 with a moonsault. Uh, very average. Really, nothing stood out here at all. I went two and a half stars. Just nothing, nothing to it, really. Uh, yeah, uh, you're right. And I was not doing anything. And I remember when he was going to be like Kiyomiya's tag team partner, and now he's working uh, opening junior matches. I thought Yano looked good here. And yeah, uh, Toge gets the win to set up for his challenge of Yoshioka later. Oh yeah, I forgot about that too. You're right. So we get that 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 could be a good junior title match. I think. Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, the opener was Akitoshi Saito beating Kenya Okada in 510. Um, you know, this was a good little opener. I mean, I didn't think it was anything uh, terrible or anything. I mean, Okada got to show off his strong kicks to start for a while, which left Saito's chest beat red. Uh, but Saito came back with a series of Uranages, his big claw slam. Uh, and then basically tells Okada to get back up instead of going for a cover and hits Enzigiri for the pin. You know, perfectly fine little open. I went two and three quarters. Uh, I don't know what the point of having Saito getting wins over, you know, talent that you would think is going to get a push soon. Uh, uh, the booking sort of dumbfounds me a bit. I guess I understand that they're not ready to pull the trigger on Okada yet. Or I thought they kind of were like he got it like a uh, new outfit and sort of thing, but so to me it was just like I don't know I you put him in a t- multi man tag don't have him like losing to a fifty something. Well, I didn't have a problem with it I guess, but I guess that's a good point. Uh, but there you go. Overall, I recall it's a very strong show. I mean, you know, three three. I think it over delivered based on what the card. Look like originally, but I have three. Even what some people thought was going to happen, yes. Yeah, I mean, I have three matches of four stars or better. Uh, you know, I wouldn't call any of them like match of the year candidates or anything, but like, you know, the main event was awesome, uh, and I definitely the show was really a really easy watch start to finish. the The set looked awesome. I mean, I we, I've mentioned this a million times by now, but it is so cool just seeing another serious men's promotion in Japan that can have this kind of production values because it feels like. For the last few years, the only men's promotion in Japan that can have high end high end production values other than New Japan is DDT, and I love DDT, but it's a very different vibe, obviously. So it is really cool seeing this like serious men's promotion, uh, you know, with the you know in a big building with you know the big the night really cool stage setup and you know the the elaborate videos and just high end production that like isn't New Japan. I mean, all Japan's production has gotten you know better too lately. But, like, you know, this is still a whole different level. So. But, yeah, I don't know if you have any other final thoughts on the show. Uh, I think I I guess maybe the second best show of the year, I would say. Uh, well, it depends how you count Wrestle Kingdom, but I think Wrestle Kingdom still edges it out. But uh, it would be my number two or three, depending on how you quantify Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, I let me think about that actually. I would call the rest of is two different shows for sure. Um, I would put, yeah, I guess I put both nights ahead of this, so this would be third so far. But yeah, third third place so far, definitely nothing to uh, you know sniff at here. Uh, speaking of New Japan, okay, so now we go over to them. Oh, I should mention. So looking ahead to the stuff for Noah, the, there's nothing on the schedule at all, really. I mean, I, I was hoping they would have something up by now. I mean, it's been. A few days, but I guess they're going to wait till after this press conference. Uh, I mean, the only thing that's on the schedule has been on the schedule for a while, which is uh, at the March seventh Great Voyage in Yokohama. We have Sugara and Sakuraba against uh, the Aggression Nakajima and Kitamiya for the GHC Tag Titles. But yeah, there's no other matches scheduled for any of their shows, including the Korka that's coming up in like a few weeks. So, oh, sorry, one little point I wanted to make is. Did like Nakajima feel like an afterthought for you now? Sort of. A bit of an astronaut <laughs> these days. Yeah. Maybe he'll win the tag titles. I don't know. I hope so, but that seems like he's spinning his wheels again because he's already won the tag titles with uh, Kitamiya. Yeah. So well. Maybe he'll get. I mean, maybe he'll get a big feud with uh, Kaito when he wins the belt back. Yeah, I think that would be something because they well they've done it, but I don't think they've done it as much as they could have. Yeah. 
All right, so transitioning over to New Japan now, uh, the two new beginning in Hiroshima shows. Um, so people who listen to the show know that I've been pretty high on New Japan since the Elite left in early 2019. I've liked a lot of their stuff. Uh, I've been really into some of their stuff, even when it seems like a lot of other people weren't into it last year. These two shows were the least I have enjoyed New Japan, you know, since the battle days of the Kenny Omega title reign. I mean, I just didn't like these two shows at all. I mean, there, there were, there's a, there's one four star match, so it's not like this was a disaster or anything, but like, you know, everything underwhelmed compared to what my expectations were. The booking was really weird and really, you know, just a lot of stuff that like either didn't make sense to me or doesn't excite me or, you know, it's just very like bizarre, like the Naito Ibushi IC thing. And yeah, I just, I've never been less excited about New Japan in the last few years. I mean, you know, they, they've won me over a little bit with that Capsule Attack Night 2 card, which does look pretty good. But like, I don't know, I'm just really not into anything going on right now it's just very just it's not really working for me right now new japan we'll talk about some of the stuff you know on these shows but like yeah it's just like i don't know just it this is the least i've been interested in new japan like since you know late 2018 so it's just you know this is a uh, i really need to get we need, really need the great okan back out here because he's like the only thing in this company that i'm super into right now but uh that's my i guess big picture new japan thoughts right now uh, so we'll start here with New Beginning in Hiroshima Night 1. Uh, this was from this past Wednesday, uh, February 10th. Uh, attendance of 1,135, which uh, was definitely not capacity because the following night they did 2007, which I guess was capacity. So, you know, definitely there's, I guess, nothing on this show made people want to show up during the pandemic. Uh, the main event was Hiromu Takahashi retaining the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title against Sho in 35-38 to make his first defense. Uh, he beat him with the Time Bomb 2. So this match, I think, has, you know, it started out a lot of uh, a lot of uh, discourse around Hiromu. I mean, I know Joe Lanza on the flagship this past week famously said he thought Hiromu was, was overrated, um, which I can't agree with that because I thought Hiromu's best of the Super Junior was you know his like Joe Joe's whole argument was he was underwhelmed by that whereas I thought Hiromu's uh BOSJ run was amazing like I thought you know he produced you know a whole bunch of like four and a half star matches and stuff for me um I will say this match was underwhelming for sure um you know just going 35 minutes just they didn't have anything you know um there wasn't enough here to go 35 minutes I guess I mean there was still plenty of stuff I really liked in this match which is why I ultimately won four stars flat on it. And it was my favorite match of the two shows. But, you know, compared to their four and a half star match at in the Best of Super Junior, I mean, this was just nowhere near as memorable or, or interesting. And, you know, it, it got the elbow stuff definitely got repetitive. I mean, you know, the positives is like when they hit the 20 minute mark with them still exchanging elbows. I mean, those first 20 minutes did, fl- you know, really flew by, which was like a positive. But at this point, it did feel like they were doing very repetitive stuff, which is obviously more of a negative. Uh, and, you know, here they are trading elbows again, just like they were, you know, at the start of the match. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, you know, there was plenty of really good stuff. I mean, there was, like, this really awesome lariat that, like, you know, quite literally folded Hiromu in half just before the 30-minute mark. I guess not literally. Nearly literally. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like, Hiromu just, like, landed straight down on his head. That was definitely a highlight. And then, you know, the closing stretch is really great with Sho following up with his cross-arm pile driver for a very, very, very close uh, near fall. You know, Hiromu follows up with the time bomb. Uh, Kevin Kelly mistakenly called it the time bomb, too, for some reason. That got a close near fall. And, yeah, and then Hiromu finally delivers the time bomb, too, for the win. And it's the longest junior title match in history. Did not need to be that long, probably. Uh, you know, so the, the positives, like I said, basically, they went 36 minutes. It didn't drag. But it definitely got repetitive. So, you know, it's definitely, it does not hold a candle to their best of Super Junior match for me. It's still four stars. Still a match I really liked. But, uh, you know, just uh, given given the fact that I do not think Karoma was overrated, uh, and given the fact that I expect more from him, uh, you know, four stars is, is a little disappointing. So. Uh, I went three and three quarters because I did feel it did, it for me, it dragged with the, all of the elbows. 
Uh, I did like the last couple of minutes. And um, yeah, I mean, again, like what's to say other than that it was too long. Although I do sort of think uh, it's interesting that uh, do you think Chrome was using the time bomb too too much? Yes, it's clearly just his new finisher now, which I thought I was I thought it was going to be more of like a a super finisher originally, but now well we could talk about that in the main event too of uh, the other uh, night. Yeah. Uh, afterwards, you know, ELP who was on English commentary, uh, he kind of hilariously like calls his own shot and basically is like, "I'm retiring from commentary again" because he had retired from commentary after the Corrigans. Goes in the ring, delivers uh, or tries to deliver sudden death to Hiromu after the match. That super kick of his with a loaded boot. Uh, Bushi runs out to save. Ishimori runs out to even the odds. Uh, Hiromu helps Bushi run them off. And then ELP formally challenges Hiromu for the junior title. Can't say that excites me at all because I'm not not the biggest fan of ELP. I mean, look, he won me over a little bit on commentary where I, he, his, com- his commentary was pretty damn good. Um... But, like, I just, I don't know, like, watching him wrestle still does not greatly excite me, honestly. So I'm really not that into this. But, yeah. So... Uh, you know what's grating on me uh, on ELP more than his, like, big singles matches, which i probably not as high on as some people, but not as low as you, is that I'm getting really fucking sick of the back rakes. Yeah. I mean, we get it, bro. You know, the joke is kind of like, it feels like it's been running to the ground at this point. But, uh, yeah, I totally agree. But, uh, let's see here. The, but, yeah, basically the, the, the theme here is, um, you know, ELP formally challenged to Romu. Or Romu says they have to put the tag titles on the line. So the tag title match will happen on one of the Road to Castle Tag shows. I think the last one. Let me just double check that. Because I didn't, I didn't bring up those cards because, you know, there's a million of them, honestly. Uh, yeah, so it was on the last one. So on the February 25th, Thursday the 25th, uh, Bushi and Hiromu challenge Ishimori and Phantasmo. Uh, and then Hiromu will challenge Phantasmo uh, for the, or Hiromu will defend against Phantasmo on Castle Attack Night 2. So that makes sense, I guess, but, uh, you know, just not anything I'm like, again, chopping at the bit to see, you know, just not not really anything I'm, you know, especially since it kind of feels like ELP could win. But Well, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things because I go 50 50 right now because the anniversary show's coming up. Yeah. But, I mean, ELP could win, too, because that's apparently they love him. And that was the plan last year and everything like that. So uh, at least it has some intrigue going into uh, who wins. Yeah, but it's more like it's it's it, it feels more like when I was like that Okada Cody Rhodes match at uh, at that new big what's it called? The uh, G1 special in USA where people thought Cody might win. And it felt like, well, well see the people <laughs> I remember that and people were like, well, Cody's pretty hot right now in the U.S. and. And New Japan's trying to make a uh, American expansion, so you don't know what could yeah, happen. Yeah, and it felt like you were watching just like on the edge of your seat because you really did not want this guy who you think sucks to win the IWGP title. It's not quite to that level, but it's close. So, you know, it's definitely the maybe the wrong kind of heat, but I don't know. Some people think there's no such thing, so. Uh, the semi-main event was for the IWGP tag team titles. Uh, the G.O.D. retains the titles, in 2908, uh, 2908 by disqualification when uh, Taichi gets disqualified for using the Iron Fingers. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where to start with this one. This is a really hard match for me to... You can call it an emotional roller coaster because it was. Yeah. I mean, look. if I can't even imagine how this looked to a person who just parachuted in for this, who wasn't watching the Road 2 shows. Because it must have looked like a fucking circus, and it must have looked so stupid. But in context, if you've been following along, like, and you and you actually like some of these wrestlers, like I do, I mean, I was, like, rooting for Taichi to get back the Iron Fingers. And so were the fans in the building. Which is, like, the kind of thing where when people talk about some of this shit, I feel like nobody acknowledges. At one point, when Taichi gets back the Iron Fingers, finally, from Tom, after it's been built up this entire tour and, you know, built up for the, um, for this entire match. Like, on English commentary, Kevin Kelly and ELP said the building was shaking. With a clap crowd, the building was shaking. People were so into seeing Taichi get these stupid fucking fingers back, the cra- the building was shaking from a clap crowd. I mean, the crowd was clearly super into that aspect of this, at least. Um, so that's the kind of thing where, like, if... If you if it doesn't mean it has to work for you, I get it. But when people talk about this stuff, sometimes they talk like nobody wants to see it, 
And that clearly isn't true. I mean, people were very into this. Um, the match itself, very hard to rate. Like, it started out very boring as a lot of G.O.D. matches start. I mean, the, you know, the G.O.D. heat segment on Taichi was pretty boring. But, like, Zach comes in and gets the hot tag. And he and Ta- Tonga Loa had a really, really awesome, like, power versus technique uh, matchup. And, you know, I- I've talked enough about Tonga Loa already. I mean, he just looks a lot better than he used to at this point. He's become a good power wrestler. Um, but, yeah, I and, mean, like, Taichi does a great job. Just, sh- just showing, like, absolute rage at Tamatanga uh, all this time of him fucking with him over those iron fingers. And it leads to a really fun closing stretch. You know, they hit the Zack Mephisto on Tama, uh, which looked like it could have been the finish, but Tonga Loa pulls the referee out of the ring at two. And that leads to a Tai Chi and Tonga Loa, like, Lariat versus Axe Bomber exchange. It's also pretty great. Uh, it ends with Tonga Loa getting the better of him with a big short on Lariat. But then uh, Tai Chi comes back with some kicks. And then, you know, Jado comes down the ramp with the Iron Fingers. We get all the all the craziness. And Taichi, you know, eventually gets the Iron Fingers. And you see Marty Asami walk, waking up behind him, telling him not to do it. And Taichi's in a trance or whatever. He hits Tama with them. Uh, and G.O.D. retained the tag titles. Um, you know, like, like for a while watching this match, I was like, why does this have such a low rating on Grapple? This got really awesome to the point where I thought it was flirting with four stars. But that is a long match to end on a stupid DQ. <laughs> like, just a long match to end on a dumb DQ. Um, you know, I get that there's some poetic justice getting the Iron Fingers back, but not getting the tag titles back because they made Taichi go berserk. Uh, I just... But who the who the fuck wants to see G.O.D. keep these damn tag belts at this point? So, I don't know. I liked it for what it was, but the ending definitely takes it down a few notches. So I went with three and a half stars, ultimately. Uh, you know, I enjoyed it. I understand. This is not a match where I'm like, if you hated it, I don't know what you were watching. If you hated this, I get it. I get why people hated it. But I enjoyed it. So that's all it comes down to at the end of the day. Uh, Two and three quarters for (laughs) me. uh, Which is, you know, not a total burial or anything. I like the stuff in the middle with uh, Zach and and Tangaloa. Uh, I mean, the main thing is... um, of course, it's just indefensible to do 29-minute DQs, even in the uh, 80s, 70s, and like in the 80s and stuff, when like both New Japan and All Japan were doing constant DQs and double countouts. They weren't doing them on, at 29 minutes, uh, you know. So that's pretty different. But uh, and also, I thought it was sort of weird. Like, do you think just like moving on because we got new tag title challenges? It just seems weird that the techers are just moving on like this or do you think this is just a a temporary thing yeah i think they're they're definitely um they're definitely going to move on for now because they're going to go they're going to i guess they're going to both like focus on the new japan cup i mean the suzuki Gun guys are not even on the um the the castle tech tour at all so they're, they're just getting the tour off so yeah i guess uh you know i guess they're just gonna go back to the singles competition for the New Japan Cup. I mean, they both said in interviews afterwards that they were going to, uh, you know, they were going to come back together after that. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. It could be a swerve where, I mean, my, my never-ending nightmare continues to be uh, Zach turning on Tai Chi and joining up with the United Empire's like Will Ospreay's partner or something. So I, I hope to God that doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, I guess we'll have to wait and see. People don't really turn out a Suzuki gun unless they leave the company. That's so true. I don't think, yeah, I don't really think it's going to happen, actually. But there you go. So that that's the, I'm sure, very controversial main event. We can blow through the rest of these this, these matches pretty quickly, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, Naito and Sonata beat Honma and Kota Ibushi in 11.02. Naito pins Honma with the Destido. This ended up being like the blow-off of the Naito Honma thing, I guess, for now. I mean, there are they are matched up a couple times during Castle Tag, actually, so I guess not quite. But yeah, they were originally supposed to match up on both nights, but they shuffled the card after the EL, the Night 2 card to match up ELP and Hiromu um, on Night 2. So Honma, you know, basically loses to Destino here, gets like another, uh, you know, fucking 25 count pinfall, and that was kind of it for him, basically, for this weekend at least, because he gets moved out of the out of facing Naito on night two. So I enjoyed this little mini feud, and you know, it's just uh, Naito's obviously moving on to Ibushi now. But yeah, he was great here again. He he like you know locked Tom in this uh, 
leg scissors and was like mocking Hanma's gravelly scream selling and just like kept mocking Hanma's voice with each stomp afterward, which got la- a lot of laughs out of the crowd. But yeah, I thought this was fine. Uh, you know, three stars, perfectly enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, it was a fun little match. Like, I'd probably go three and a quarter. Uh, I thought Naito was awesome here. And uh, I think his uh, uh, Hanma mocking is might be the promo of the year so far. Yes, that was so great. Uh, match number three was the 10-man tag. Uh, the team of Chaos, Okada, Ishii, Goto, Yoshihashi, and Yana, which we didn't mention, by the way. You, you kind of did, but didn't say who. Uh, Goto, Yoshihashi challenged G.O.D. with the tag titles. Oh, no, I guess that happened on May 2. Never mind. Yeah, so that, they are the next tag team challengers. Uh, yeah, Okada, Ishii, Goto, Yoshihashi, and Yano uh, beat the Bullet Club team, Evil, Jay White, Yujiro Takahashi, Ishimori, and Phantasmo. Uh, Yano schoolboy Yujiro in 1208. Um, you know, it was a... It was alright. I mean, the whole six-man team went right after Jay White at the start and, like, stomped the hell out of him. That was kind of funny. And uh, Gato yelled out an extremely naughty word that rhymes with, uh, I don't know, Doc Duckers, I guess. I don't, I don't know if that rhymes, but just a very bad word you should not say, Gato. Someone tell him to stop saying that. Uh, then a six-man... Uh, the, the, like, the highlight of the match was probably the six-man abdominal stretch during the Yoshihashi Heat segment where they all, like, stretched out on the entire floor with, like, all connected and whatever. Like, I, I don't know why Gato didn't get in there too while he was at it, but uh, it was kind of funny. But yeah, Yano schoolboys UGR for the pin after the low blow. Kind of amusing stuff. Otherwise, your typical Bullet Club brawl. Two and three quarters. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it did what it had to do to set up the next couple of nights. Um, but, I don't know. I wish they would use the 10-man format a little more sparingly these days. But what are you going to do? They love their big tags. It's true. Uh, match number two. The other singles match on the show. Bushi. Defeats Master Watto in 1108 with the MX. Uh, definitely a surprising result, you know, because he'd already beaten him in the best of Super Junior, and typically New Japan kind of does that even Steven booking. But they did not do that here. Uh, Watto e- eats the MX and loses clean. But yeah, I mean, uh, this was good. I mean, I thought, you know, it, it, it was like a little sloppy or awkward at times, maybe, but like, you know, they they definitely kept it, they kept it on a, a certain level. They never, like, you know they never completely lost uh you know track of what they were doing or like fell off a cliff or anything um you know i thought it was a good action you know i enjoyed it i went three and a half stars on it yeah i liked it too uh i dare say and i know this is a low bar that uh wato is kind of improving yeah for sure i think you know he still Maybe makes not. some really funny faces, I have to say. Especially when he's trying to look serious while trying to do, like, his weird little hand pose after a move. But, like, other than that, he's improving, I think. Although I wonder if he's too deep to ever pull himself out. But, I don't know. I mean, I surprisingly, I will say that I'm not completely writing him off yet. I just, although I think he's got a ways to go. Yeah. Uh, match number one, the opener here. Uh, it was the Suzuki Goon team, Minoru Suzuki, Desperado, and Kanemaru, beating the Young Lions, Suji, Uemura, and Kid. Suzuki submits Uemura at the in 8 0 the Boston Crab. So, this was basically the blow off of the little Suzuki Uemura mini feud that's been going on at Korokin with uh, uh, Uemura getting a su- going surprisingly hard at Suzuki and like really hanging with him on the last Korokin from Monday, especially. Uh, kind of like leading a Young Lion charge against Suzuki Goon here. But Suzuki like elbows him, slaps the shit out of him. And puts him in a Boston Crab for the win to blow that off. But yeah, hell of an ending to a fun opener. Went about three stars on it. Uh, I went three and a half. I oh, thought wow. this was awesome. Uh, just, I mean, it was, I mean, it was a Yurimura and Suzuki show. But, and like, I really like the chemistry of the three young lines. And, and I know this is sort of not the way that New Japan books, but giving them a never six-man title shot at some point would not be the worst idea. Call 1-888-FARMERS to switch and you could save an average of $470 on your auto insurance. That's a lot of money in just a few minutes. With savings like that, you could be lounging on an impractical amount of ornate and overpriced throw pillows you bought for your couch. But you won't, because you're better with money than that. 
That's why you're calling us in the first place. Call 1-888-FARMERS to get a quote today. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Based on average nationwide annual savings survey data, July to December 2020. Underwritten by Farmers, Trucker, Fire Insurance, Exchanges, or Affiliate. Products not available in every state. Actually, given the way the titles are treated, I don't think it's a big deal to have the them challenge for it. Because I really like this trio and how they work together. There you go. So night one, um, I think definitely the better of the two nights for sure, uh, as we'll get into here. I mean, like... Actually recapping it, I guess I didn't hate it as much as uh, I felt like I hated it. Maybe it was just the directions and stuff. But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the main event was really good. There's some some decent stuff on the undercard and stuff. But like, man, uh, you know, just not excited at all for Hiromu ELP. Uh, night two, the main event here. Kota Ibushi beats Sonata in 27-51 with the Kamigoe to make his second defense of the heavyweight and IC titles. I don't know. Like, this one, I mean, they they, they were, like, th- this match went, like, 27-51 here felt like 27 hours and 51 minutes. I mean, you know, the crowd was really into it. I mean, they're doing the extra loud clapping at the start. Um, but then, you know, they, they go into this mat wrestling that just was not interesting at all. Like, you know, I like a lot of mat wrestling, but this mat wrestling just, there wasn't anything going on here. Um, you know, they get... We get, like, a long leg scissors from Sonata after, like, the five-minute mark. Uh, and then it didn't help that Zack Sabre Jr. was the English commentator here. And, you know, I saw people say that he sounded like he was doing, like, golf or something. I mean, he was so soft-spoken that you couldn't even hear him over just the sound of people clapping sometimes. So I'd hate to hear how he sounded with, like, a normal non-COVID crowd. I mean, just, like, I don't know. Uh, we get to 15-minute call. They trade Rana's. Uh, you know, it was just a, at this point, I would say it was like a good match that was kind of boring, but man, there were some more, uh, problems coming here. Um, you know, the Sonata, he goes to Skull M for the first time. He puts Coda out. He then goes for the big moonsault at the top and misses. I hate that spot. Just keep your hold on and go for the referee stoppage. I will say Kevin Kelly and Zach did say, like basically said the exact same thing after he missed the moonsault and then Kevin Kelly tried to cover for him and like a commenta- a good commentator should and said you know Sonata feels compelled to try to win with the moonsault as an ode to his mentor Keiji Muto which you know that makes sense that's good I'm glad he said that but I just I hate that spot I really hate that spot uh Sonata flips back into the skull end Coda quickly reverses this time lifts him straight up into the lawn dart in the corner uh, the actual toss is like one of the worst ones he's ever done here. It just looked very gentle and kind of stupid. Uh, Coda teases a swan dive German, and then Sonata fights out with some very gentle forearms, and then goes to TKO on Ibushi off the apron, and bo- something goes wrong here. What the fuck happened here? Like, I know that people say Sonata botches a lot. What the hell was Coda doing on this move? Like, he came down at such a weird angle that it looked completely ridiculous. I honestly think Coda may have been the bigger fuck-up on this move. I don't know if you disagree. I, maybe, you, maybe you saw it differently than I did. I thought Coda fucked this up more than anything. Yeah, I think Coda uh, fucked it up more, although there is sort of a, uh, a cutter-like move later on that Sonata does definitely botch. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but yeah, the... Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just like... They, they, for all the years too, they show a fucking replay of this. Like, you guys don't do enough replays of good moves, and you do a replay of that. And the landing sounded like nothing too, which certainly doesn't help. It just looked like Coda jumped off the apron while Sonata held on to him, and Coda came down like a really weird angle. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the other one. I didn't even take a note of that. Well, what was the fuck, the other fuck up on the cutter? Uh, he just throws him up, and, and, and it's like the toss up cutter, but, Sonata like doesn't actually make any contact oh, right, 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 right. his head when he's supposed to, right? Yeah. It's just like he flies up, flies down, and Sonata misses him. <laughs> I, I, I should have taken a note of that too. I don't know why I didn't. But yeah, um, they go through like this kind of awkward exchange uh, that ends with Coda blocking the O'Connor roll. He hits the, he gets the comic going to the back. It looks very light again. Um, he gets the comic going to the front. Sonata surprisingly kicks out. I'm like. Why is Sonata kicking out of the, the like the, the full course kind of go? I don't understand. Uh, Kota pulls his knee pad off, goes for another kind of go. Sonata counters by backsliding him and gets another flash roll up. 
Uh, Bulls were very close to count. So this is like the best part of the match, probably. The roll-ups are, the, they do the roll-up near falls better than almost anybody. Uh, he goes for the O'Connor roll again. Coda gets out of it, hits a high kick, the step-up knee, and the Kamigoi for the pen. I did not know how to rate this one. It definitely wasn't bad. But it was at best like a good match that was not that was pretty underwhelming at times and had an extremely large botch on the TKO to the to the floor like an extremely large botch like you're you're not like if this was like a fucking four and a half star match fine you know it takes down a four and a quarter but like, this match was not that great to begin with and then to have a that big of a botch on a a spot that you're hoping to be the signature spot of the match that will hopefully elevate it was just really bad for them. I mean, just really bad. Uh, it was boring as shit a lot of the way. And then some of, like, the knee strikes and stuff just did not land flush at all. It looked very gentle. So, you know, it was a microcosm of the feud in a lot of ways. Just nothing landed like you were expecting it to. Uh, so, I don't know. Without the TKO botch, I would go three and a half. I'll take a quarter star off. It's three and a quarter. Nowhere near as good as their G1 final that people didn't even like that much. I at least won four stars flat on that one. But this was not... I mean, this was, you know... A very, very, very underwhelming uh, main event. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I feel bad for Coda because he's matched up with uh, Sonata. as his first big post Wrestle Kingdom feud. And Sonata just, I mean, I like Sonata, but like they just never clicked as a pairing, you know, in the in the build, in this match. I mean, it just never worked. And, you know, this was worse to me than, I, than every single Naito Evil match that people complained about. I mean, for sure. Uh, it was nowhere close to the Power Struggle match and was, you know, I, I think worse than the Dominion match and the Summer Struggle match. So, I don't know. It was not good. Uh, so, I am the, I guess, uh, have to uh, admit something. I guess I'm a bit of a Sonata defender, although I never really thought of myself as one. Because I was going back and I was like, hmm, I have a lot of high rating for Sonata matches that people were not so high on. And I went four even here. I'm, I'm a, quite aware of the botches, and in fact, I'm not even a big fan of the way that the Kamigoye was uh, is now become a, a, a kickout move, and you have to wait for uh, Bushi to pull his D-pad down. But for whatever reason, I still really enjoyed the work. The match kept my attention, and I just thought I think in part one of the reasons I liked it is that the way the crowd was into it really helps, given the normal circumstances that of of sort of clap crowds so when they're really into something i really think it helps these days so that's my you know defense of this one yeah i don't know i just couldn't it's not it wasn't close to that level for me but you know it is what it is i guess i mean this was for sure I'm trying to think the last time i didn't enjoy a iwgb title match in this level i guess it, would it be the three way from king of pro wrestling i guess i'm trying to think because like no, maybe that Okada Sonata. Didn't, didn't you hate? Sorry. Well, didn't you hate an Okada Sonata from like was it Dotaku? Yeah, so I think that would be it. Because I went four and a half. I went like three. Match. I think I went like three and a half. So <laughs> I think this is still so, lower. This is probably the least I've enjoyed. Yeah, since the three way King of Pro Wrestling, I think. So, which uh, the the the, uh, the 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 constant there is Kota Ibushi. So I guess Kota Kota got to drop these belts. I guess. Uh, <laughs> so I made a. I'm kidding. For anybody who, like gets very mad at me. I don't blame Coda here at all, really, but just just this feud didn't work and this match didn't work. What are you going to do? Uh, semi-main event, the never open weight. Oh, I, well, okay. The post-match here. So Tetsuya Naito walks out. I am momentarily very excited. I'm like, holy shit, they're doing Naito Ibushi again already? What the fuck? Uh, he comes out and he challenges him for just the Intercontinental. What the fuck? What the fuck is this? Like, look. I understand... He does not want them to unify the belts. But this idea... Because Naito's explanation seems to be... Uh, well, I lost to Kota Ibushi at the Tokyo Dome. So I don't think I'm worthy of challenging for both belts or even just the heavyweight. You gave this man a shot at the double titles... Out of the goodness of your fucking heart? In, in storyline, this is what happened. Kota Ibushi lost the briefcase to Jay White. Obviously, Jay White cheated, but that's not... Uh, Naito's problem. Naito had no no reason to do that. He basically said, I want to fight Kota Ibushi anyway, so I'm giving Kota this challenge on 1-4. He did not have to do that. He did it because, you know, he he wanted to fight Kota or whatever. If, you know, if anybody on the entire planet 
in the history of New Japan deserved an automatic rematch, it is Naito. He gave this guy this challenge when he didn't have to. And frankly, I think it makes Kota Ibushi look like kind of a bitch as far as being a babyface to not immediately go, well, look, you you gave me that title challenge on 1-4. You don't have to challenge just for the IC, buddy. You can challenge for both. Or at least challenge for the heavyweight. Like, it makes no fucking sense with, with, the, with the story they already told leading up to Wrestle Kingdom. It just makes no sense. It's bad booking. If they wanted to do this, they should have had a different way to get to Naito Ibushi on 1-4 and, you know, Jay White on 1-5. Because for Naito to gift Kota Ibushi that double title challenge where he didn't have to, and for Kota to turn around and be like, yeah, you can challenge with just the IC, whatever. Like, it just makes Kota, it makes Kota look bad. It makes Naito look like an idiot. It just doesn't... The entire thing does not work at all. And, you know, I... I don't know what the fuck this is leading to. Maybe Kota's just going to beat him and unify the titles anyway. Who knows? I think probably Naito's going to win and, you know, take the Intercontinental back. I mean, I, I don't really have a problem with him, like, winning the Intercontinental from, like, a, I've seen some people say, oh, he hated the title. I'm like, well, you're, like, three years behind the storyline there because he, he, he embraced the title eventually and, you know, decided to, you know, like, uh, reunify them or whatever. He came out on all, or, or like try to hold them both at the same time. Like he, he embraced the title. He came out all, in all white for that match at Okada. That was him embracing the title. I, he says he has some idea for what he wants to do with it. I, I don't know what the fuck that could be. I guess we'll find out if he wins. But like, it just doesn't feel like there's much left him for him to do with this belt. I mean, like, you know, he already held it when he won both belts for the first time ever. I mean, you know, he's had long range with it before. I just don't really see what there is to do with him. I'm not saying he has to be the heavyweight champion or nothing, but, like, I would rather see him do something different, like tag title reign with Shingo, or, you know, a fucking blood feud with somebody not for a title, or anything. Like, I just don't care about him with this white belt again. Maybe they'll make me care, you know, after Castle Attack if he wins it back. I mean, the press conference stuff and the interviews, you know, the full translated promos were a little better. It came off a little better than it, than it did to me in this exact moment. But, yeah, I just, you know, the, the fact that they, they booked a rematch of my current 2021 match of the year, Naito and Ibushi, and managed to do it in such a way that I was left feeling underwhelmed, which, that's almost impressive, honestly. I mean, that's really almost impressive. Uh, and it just, you know, I just don't think parts of it make sense with what they've already done, and I'm not really that excited. So, I don't know if you feel any differently, but that's how I feel as a Naito fan. Uh, well... To me, the biggest thing, and this is like, I guess, sort of the way that I I feel about booking and how I like I when I play like wrestling sims, I'm, I'm a very conservative booker. So to me, having Naito beat Abushi for the IC belt, which I think is probable, makes um, Abushi just look like a chump. Like you have your main champ, your heavyweight champion, lose the secondary title while retaining the uh, the main title that that bothers me on like a, a certain like level, I guess that's my biggest issue yeah. with it really. And like, what is it? And to have it happen right before New Japan Cup is also confusing. Like, what does that mean for New Japan Cup? Does that mean Naito won't enter if he wins? Does that mean um, you know the winner will go back to choosing which belt they want to challenge for? Which was always stupid because it was like, why would anyone not choose the heavyweight? Um, I I don't know. I just I don't like any of this. I just don't like the timing. I don't like. The, I don't think it makes sense with the prior booking. I don't think it's exciting for Naito. And I even, like you said, it makes Ibushi look like kind of a loser if he loses. And it makes Naito look like a double loser if he loses, too. Because it's like, you challenged specifically for the white belt and you couldn't even win that from this guy. And you couldn't prevent this guy from unifying these titles like you wanted to. I don't, I, it feels like a lose-lose to me. Uh, I, like, I just don't really see what there is to get excited about here. But, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts before we move on? Um, well, maybe this is a bit of a, a long-term thinking, but like, you know, if you can, if they can get full dome capacity next year, um, you know, I think there's still that thought that you can get that, uh, Okada versus Naito one more time. And if, oh, if Naito wins the IC title here, I just don't see how getting to that again makes any sense. Well, you could either, you could either have Naito drop it pretty quick, I guess, or you could yeah, do, which, which, what, what, sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, I, he drops it and then does the loser gimmick again and redeems himself. But, like... But that's been done. That's been done, yeah. And, like, if he's gonna... 
if he's gonna win the uh you know if he's gonna if the, the other thing they could do i guess is do Naito versus okada for the ic when okada's never held the ic before but like you're gonna need a real good explanation for why okada wants to hold the intercontinental after he spent all this time saying the belt sucks so i don't know i guess we'll see you know it's hard to know exactly where they're going at this point like unpredictability can be good obviously but they might be a little too unpredictable right now in not a good way. So, you know, it's just kind of shit doesn't make a lot of sense right now. So, uh, the semi main event here for the never open weight six man titles, uh, the team of Ishii, Goto, and Yoshihashi beat the team of Jay White and G.O.D. Uh, Yoshihashi pins Tonga Loa in 2701 with the King Koji. Definitely went long here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I thought this was really good. I went three and three quarters. Um, you know, this Chaos six-man team has been really good. Uh, you know, they did, they had, this was like a lot of action here and, you know, just quite a quite a bit of fun. Uh, you know, didn't quite get to four stars. Maybe they could have cut some time, you know, but like definitely did enjoy it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, <laughs> you know, the, the only thing I guess was kind of stupid was like the the fact that we needed, they, they had started using interference to try to stop the awesome force that is Yoshihashi was a little absurd where it's like, you know, he's this underdog who wins with cradles and stuff. I, if anybody, if you should not need to cheat to be anybody, it's him. I mean, just was very weird that they were doing a lot of cheating against Yoshihashi towards the end, but that's bullet club. They just cheat against everybody, I guess. But yeah, I went three and three quarters. I enjoyed it. Uh, definitely the highlight of the show. And afterwards, Yoshihashi issued a challenge for the IWGP tag team titles for he and Goto. So that will happen on Castle Tag Night 2. I mean, that could be good. I mean, him him and Goto have been quietly really good here, especially in the six-man division. And, you know, I think they could have a really good match with DOD. We'll see. Uh, I just want the full four on this. I really liked it a lot. It didn't feel like it went 27 minutes, unlike uh, the other tag match uh, the day before. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm the, we. this is like the greatest never six-man reign ever, as far as I'm concerned, really. Yeah. And, Not uh, a lot of competition, uh, but <laughs> and uh, and I think there's a possible chance that Ishi and Yoshihashi win because I think that sort of would make sense, and I think that would help the Yoshihashi story, which I feel like actually has momentum. But at the same time, it would not shock me if um, New Japan wants. G.O.D. to show up on Dynamite holding the tag titles because I think that's coming. Yeah, I'm sure it probably is. Uh, okay. Now we get to match number four. Kazuchika Okada and Toriano against Evil and Dick Togo. It goes to a double count out in 127. So, the match ends immediately with a double count out uh, as Evil beats on Okada. Just lets himself get counted out. Chokes him with a chair. Uh, Okada says, I want a singles match right now. Which Evil tells Dick Togo to go to the back. And the match actually restarts as a singles match. I can't remember the last time New Japan's ever done something like that. I mean, who the fuck even has the authority to do that? I guess Red Shoes does. Red Shoes came out and did it. But, like, that was something. Um, it's the... Well- it's like reverse WWE yeah. <laughs> because what happens is it starts as a singles match. There's a counter in DQ, but then it becomes like a tag yeah. match of some kind. It was like the Teddy Long thing in reverse. Yeah. Uh, but then the singles match goes five minutes and 41 seconds and Okada wins by disqualification. I mean, the fans are very into the singles match starting at least, but Okada, he gets the money clip, the fucking money clip on Evil. He starts getting out. Evil gets his foot in the bottom rope to break. And then Evil gets the Scorpion Deathlock on Okada just after the five-minute call. And while Okada's in the Deathlock, presumably could tap right now, this is his submission finisher, Dick Togo runs out with the Garot Wire. Why? Why the fuck would he... Why would they do that? Why would the plan be, okay, let's... <laughs> I have a plan, Dick. Let's restart. I'm going to accept his challenge. You can go to the back like you're, uh, you know, like you're... I'm getting, like, so angry I can barely talk. Like, <laughs> like you're going to the back. Like, you know, we're not going to have you interfere. But, you know, don't come out when Okada gets me and his submission finisher. Uh, you know, if I, uh, let, trust me, I can make it to the ropes. But the moment I have Okada in my fucking finisher, in that scorpion, I want you to hit the ring. Excuse Why would you do that? Why would you do that? 
I'd like... I don't understand what the fuck the point is supposed to be. Why would Evo tell Dick Togo to come out then? Why would Dick Togo come out there and, uh, come out there on his own? If he did come out there on his own, why would Evo not turn to Dick Togo and be like, Hey, asshole, I had him in the Scorpion Deathlock. He might have tapped out. Uh, what was the point of any of this? I, look, here's my, the only thing I can say here. I understand that Naito versus Evil was for the double championship. And people, and that's probably why people hated, hated it more. And plus, Western fans just like Okada more than Naito. I get that too. But this Okada Evil feud is 10 trillion times fucking worse than Naito Evil ever was. This feud sucks fucking shit. This feud is so fucking bad. They spent weeks on these Korkins with Okada supposedly wanting the singles match with Evil. First of all, why, it's never explained why he suddenly cares that Evil beat him in the New Japan Cup like seven fucking months ago, but suddenly he cares about that. Uh, and after, after not caring for months and months and months. Second of all, he supposedly really wants this guy in a singles match. He's supposedly angry that he won't give him the singles match. But he gives every fucking promo with a giant smirk on his face. The same shit-eating grin that he always gives. And he did not in this show. This show, I guess he did show a little more anger finally. But those Corkins, he had that fucking smirk on his face. Where it's like, you're supposed to be mad. You're supposed to be taking this seriously. And you don't give a fuck. And Evil does everything with a smirk on his face. So yeah, it just didn't work at all. And then on the last Corkin before this, we're supposed to take seriously. Evil did the the fucking chair baseball swing that he does as a comedy spot in all of his matches dating back to when he was a babyface that like Yoshihashi can recover for, from in a fucking minute during the matches. And he did this as a serious post-match attack that left Okada laying. This is the worst feud this is going to fucking wrap up Worst Feud of the Year in fucking February. This feud fucking sucks. I don't know. If you feel differently, Gerard, please let me know. But I hated this. I hate this feud. I hate this pairing. I cannot stand it. They need to figure out a different way to book Okada when he's not champion. Because everything they do with this guy when he's not in the title picture is fucking terrible. Uh, well, I don't hate the feud because the feud doesn't really make me feel anything, which I guess is bad also. Um, but I I might sound crazy here, but I kind of thought the five minutes that they wrestled here was actually not bad, barring the finish. Um, so I, I don't have completely... I'm not going to completely, like, shit over the idea of, like, watching the match or anything, because it could still be decent. But I, I understand if it, like... It elicits visceral hatred from some people too. <laughs> I just fucking hate it. I like, what was the point of that finish? Why would they do that? Why not have J- Dick Togo run out when he had him in the fucking, uh, you know? Why not have him run out when he's in the middle of the fucking money clip? Like, why have him run out when he's has him in his hold? Because they want to punish Okada. That's the only thing I can come up with. I don't know. I can't think of anything else better. Yeah, it's just very. Very bizarre, and you know, I just don't, I don't know what, it, I don't know what how to say anything at this point anymore. But it is, uh, I don't know, it is what it is at this point, I guess. But anyway, uh, the you know, evil pose was about an Okada, uh, his boot on Okada, two sweets Togo, good for him. I hated this match number three, uh, Lij. Naito, Hiromu, and Bushi beat Bullet Club, Yujiro, uh, Ishimori, and Phantasmo. Naito pins Yujiro in 954 with the Destido. Uh, so, yeah, this was uh, fine, I guess. I mean, look, you know, Naito and Yujiro fighting it out for all old time's sake was uh, all right. There's really just not much juice here at this point. You know, uh, the closing stretch was kind of fun with a big assisted dropkick by Hiromu, a dive from Bushi. Uh, before Naito polishes Yuji off for a second straight pinfall, which makes sense because he was going to challenge Kota for one belt, not for both belts. Uh, but yeah, two and three quarters, you know, it was our, it was fine. Yeah, Gentleman's Three, it was a nice little undercard match. I mean, I think all of like 
very rarely is there something where you could be like, yeah, I think that was just painfully average for an LIJ on, uh, undercard multi-man. I think they're always solid. Yeah. Uh, match number two here uh, was a six-man tag team match. Uh, the team of Tomaki Hanma, Sho, and Master Wato beating Minoru Suzuki, Desperado, and Kanemaru. Wato, Pink Kanemaru with the La Cartera? I don't know. 807 is Wacky Cradle thing. He basically got to get a uh, a little finish here, a little pin back because after losing the night before. But he also completely botched the finish. He was like unable to get over Kanemaru at first to do his little wacky roll-up. And then even when he finally got his legs over him, he was right on top of the ropes. Uh, the ref counted three anyway, but yeah. That looked horrible. Had to take points off for that, but I went like two and a half stars on it. Yeah, it was fine. Uh, finish was botched. Although I, I feel like if, if Wado pins Kanemaru, is that going to set up another singles match and now Kanemaru's going to win? Like, I don't know. If this is just like a long, like, are we just going to, like, punish Wato for everything phase of constantly just lose the big matches to even, like, mid-card juniors? Yeah. I guess so. Uh, match number one. Uh, was another six fan tag. Suzuki Goon, Taichi, ZSJ, and Doki beat the Young Lions of Suji, Orimura, and Kid. Uh, Taichi pins Kid at 851. Or Zach pins Kid, I'm sorry, or submits him at 851 with the ZSJ style wrist lock. This was a fun little opener. Uh, you know, not, not a ton to or anything, but Zach torturing Kid at the end was a definite highlight. I went like put three stars on it. Yeah, I'd go three, uh, two. I just, yeah, I just sort of didn't quite have quite the intensity of the over the night before. But like, uh, you know, I think um, if Techers aren't going for the tag titles, I think they should go after the six men with Doki. Yeah, that would work. All right, so I guess final thoughts on night two. I definitely did not like it as much as night one. I mean, I would say the only thing to watch in this show is the never six man. And even that, I wouldn't call it like essential or anything. But I mean, if you want to watch it. Um, you know, just a lot of stuff here that just didn't work for me, especially obviously the Okada evil thing and the main event and, you know, uh, just a really disappointing and not very good show. Uh, you seem to like it more than I did, especially with the main event. Yeah. So I give the edge tonight too, because I thought the, the top and the semi main were uh, both better than the night before. I thought the, maybe the undercard of night one was a little livelier. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and I, like, stupid booking aside, I didn't totally hate the angle between <laughs> Okada and, and Evil, although I wouldn't, like, praise it or anything. So, yeah, I'll give the slight edge tonight, too. Uh, so now what's coming up in, you know, only, like, two weeks uh, is Castle Attack, uh, less than two weeks now, on February 27th and 28th. These cards are very interesting, I will say. Like, the night one card looks pretty horrible. Uh, looks pretty fucking terrible. So it opens up with a six-man Tanahashi, Tenzan, and Kojima against the Empire, Okan, Osprey, and Cobb. That should be good, you know, should be fine. But then we have Yoshihashi versus Tonga Loa and Hiroki Goto versus Tama Tonga, uh, two singles matches to build the following night's tag title match. If they would swap the G.O.D. guys there, if we got to see Tonga Loa and Goto, like, trade lariats, that could be really cool. But the way these two matches are, like, I really can't see them being that good. I don't know. Do you feel any differently about these? Uh, is it Yoshihashi versus Tongaloa? Yoshihashi versus Tong yeah, Tongaloa, yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be good, actually. Oh, okay. Because Yoshihashi is like the great underdog, and, you know, Tongaloa is great power wrestler in that well. Maybe great is a strong word, but a much improved power wrestler. So, yeah, I think that, that actually could be fun. Yeah. Uh, then we had Provisional KOPW 2021. Toriano against Chase Owens. Uh, <laughs> that's Sir Toriano versus Chase Owens, sir, for the top. Uh, uh, if you're like excited for that, God bless you. That's all I can say. I don't know. <laughs> if you want to yeah, that. strap strap matches suck. Yeah, well, that like, I mean, we or that's the four corners style. Does Yano right, have to? Right, Yano right. Yano has to counter his own. It's four corners, right? Well, Yano yeah. has to counter his own stipulation, doesn't he? Like it's got to go to a vote. 
Like the oh, I guess yeah. so. But I, I kind of felt like that was what it was going to be. Yeah, but, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Semi main event. The only thing on the show that looks decent to me, Ishii against Jay White. I mean, that could be really good. Uh, you know, they had a really good match at the G One, so that's the one uh, standout on the show. But I don't know. Yeah, I think it'll be great. But... Main event: Kazuchika Okada versus Evil. Uh, <laughs> You know, they've had good matches before. They had a good match in the G1 a couple of times. They've also had very bad matches before. Uh, you know, the, the New Japan Cup final from last year was... I, I still think that blows away anything from Naito Evil. Not to sound like a broken record, but, like, you know, that match was horrible. Uh, and they also had a really bad one uh, at King, King of Pro Wrestling 2017, which was, not, you know, an IWGP title match main event that was just really underwhelming. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the way this feud has gone, I will be really surprised if they have, like, a blow-away great match here. Uh, maybe they will, but I, I cannot be excited for I it. think it will depend on this, on uh, Okada's mental state and whether or not he wants to try to have something good or he's just going to phone it in. Yeah. And then uh, Night 2, on the other hand, Night 2 looks great. Uh, opens up with Tenkoji against Osprey and Cobb. You know, that could be that could be pretty fun. Uh then we have Okada, Ishii, and Yano against Evil, Jay White, and Chase. That'll probably be short at least. And then your top four matches here, you have G.O.D. against Goto and Yoshihashi for the tag titles, which, you know, I think that could be really good. Uh, you know, Goto and Yoshihashi have been really good this year, and, you know, I think they definitely... And given his position on the card, it's not going to go 29 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, then the never open weight title match, Tanahashi against Great Okan. Uh, you know, I like their match with the Dome. I went like three and a half on it. Uh, I think they'll have an even better one here, and it should be a big moment with Okan likely to win. Okan's winning, yeah. yeah, I know. People were like, oh, I'm excited to see Tanahashi with the Never title. Like, think of all the different matches he can have. I'm like, no, he's <laughs> dropping this to Okan in a month or yeah. less. Then the semifinal, this will be like, this match will be like the big, you know, will this really be, uh, you know, you know, I don't know. This will be the one where it's like, is this show going to be good or good or great? So, um, you know, I, I think Hiromu and El Fantasmo, you know, if they can have a better match than they had at the Tokyo Dome, then this show could be great. If it's about what they have to Dome again, then the show, you know, will struggle a little bit to reach that level. But uh, I think it'll be better than the, the Dome match, uh, which I went like, I don't know, three and a half on. Uh, I think it's just a lot to do with the placement on the card and the way that that match really sort of felt like an afterthought anyway. Like the way the, the, the build to it was just like, oh, you know, Super J Cup winner versus best of the Super Junior winner to set up the match the next night. So I suspect um, that it, it will be better. Although it's sort of interesting if 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 El Fantasmo is winning, I'm sort of interesting. Like, does that mean he'll like try harder and not do the bullshit or he's just going to up it? Because he needs to get more heel heat. I don't know. Yeah, I guess we'll see. And the main event for the Intercontinental title only, Kota Ibushi versus Tetsuya Naito. I mean, look, they never have a bad match together, so I'm sure it'll be really good. And, you know, I will, watching this on Spoiled, I'm sure I'll really be at the edge of my seat here with thinking either guy could win. But uh, I just don't. I still don't. I, I said my piece about it already. I just think it's stupid. It's for the Intercontinental title. But, you know, uh, still going to be good, though. So, definitely looks like a better car than night one. That is for sure. But I guess we'll wait and see once we get there. How just how much better? And the Corrigans, uh that started today. I haven't I haven't seen it yet. You know, other than uh, I heard the young lion injured his elbow. Unfortunately, the new the new young lion uh, Yoto Nakashima. But yeah, um, you know that's uh, that's New Japan. We'll see where things go from there. I mean, there really isn't a lot of downtime. I mean, they come back uh, on Thursday, March fourth, of the anniversary show. And then, you know, the following day on Friday, they kick off the New Japan Cup. So just not a lot of downtime between tours here. Have they announced any uh, New, Japan, New Japan Cup venues yet? Yeah, they have the whole schedule on there. Oh, they yeah. do. So, and then, Is it a million Corrigans? Uh, I believe so. One, okay. two, three. Actually, only three. Yeah. Oh, there's wow. A okay. other, there's a lot of other show, touring and stuff. So, um. Then Road to Soccer Genesis has two straight Corrigans again. And then, yeah, 29th and 30th. And then, 
Yeah, they, they seem to cut back a little bit on the Corkins after this castle attack craziness. So, like, well, see, like, were they thinking that like the state of emergency was going to be lifted and they could tour more? I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. It's interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, so that is it for New Japan. Uh, like I said, not thrilled with them right now, but I'm willing to see how things go, at, you know, into and after castle attack. All right. It's not as bad as some people will say. I'll just say that. Well, you mean you mean me, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean people like I don't know. I mean, like I people I think are more well, I know I know that you have not previously been as down on the company, but like I don't know, I've enjoyed twenty twenty one from them so far. Yeah. I mean I was into I was into what they were doing before these two shows, but these two shows are just not not good. Uh Let's move over to DDT to wrap things up here with DDT Kawasaki Strong. Uh, that took place today, February 14th, at the Colts Kawasaki. Uh, there was 900 fans, which they said was a sellout, so I guess it wasn't that big of a building or anything and with the uh, you know with the reduced capacity. But yeah, this, the, the venue looked cool as hell. Because like you had this, uh, you know, the, the big stage in the background behind one of the sets of seats for them to come out. Uh, it just looked like a really, it looked like a really cool venue, honestly, so... Uh, but yeah, the main event here, the KOD open weight title, Jun Akiyama defeats Tetsuya Endo with the modified Sternness Dust Alpha and 31-11. So Endo falls in his fourth defense and Jun Akiyama becomes the 76th KOD champion. Uh, we see in the pre-match video, Kobashi helped Endo train to face Akiyama. Uh, certainly there's probably no one better to ask to beat. If you want to ask how to beat Jun Akiyama in a big title match, uh, also, Kenta Kobashi had this, like, this black face mask with that weird little squiggly line pattern from his black Noah tights. That's just ridiculously cool. I really want one of those now. But yeah, that was really cool. Uh, and then Kobashi gets his own entrance as the special witness. Uh, the, can you imagine being like that, the DET ring announcer and getting, getting told, hey, you get, to, uh, you get to introduce Kobashi Kenta tonight. Like, that must have been a mark out moment for him, you know? But uh, there you go. Uh, but yeah, the, the main, the actual match here, um, you know, this, a, a lot of it was like Endo working over Akiyama's leg for a while. So, okay. DDT Universe had problems throughout this show. I was trying to watch this show live and, you know, the feed froze for me a few times during this match and went down for me for about four minutes. So that was annoying. Not the wrestlers fault at all, obviously, but, uh, you know, I went back and tried to fill in the gaps on what I missed, uh, you know, earlier today. And, you know, I, I only missed like a few minutes of it. I didn't really miss that much because uh, the very legitimate other feed of the show, for some reason, came back before I was able to get back into Universe. So that's how I ended up watching the rest of it. But yeah, it was, uh, you know, Universe having a problem. It's one of those double-edged swords where, on one hand, that's not good. You'd hope the uh, Universe would would hold up better and not have these issues. On the other hand, it means there was a lot of interest in the show, presumably, that they were crashing the servers and stuff. So, you know, that that's probably a good thing. But yeah, hopefully they're uh, better prepared next time. Um, but yeah, Akiyama, you know, ends up getting his front neck lock in really tight. It looks like Endo is going out. But uh, finally, um, you know, he gets it. Uh, you know, Akiyama, like, kind of stupidly lets go of it to cover. And Endo kicks out. It's the same thing I complained about with Sonata, except arguably even worse, because... He lets go of the front neck lock just to go for a pin. It's like, just wait for the ref to fucking call the match. Why are you going for a pin? Uh, that was pretty stupid. They trade a, a German and an exploder during these dueling no cells before Endo, like, really smartly uh, goes to June's leg with a super kick to put a stop to that. Basically, like, I'm not going to keep trying to just trade suplexes with you. I'm going to, you know, go back to this leg I worked on earlier. He gets a torture rack bomb for a two count. Uh, the moment Akiyama kicks out, Endo goes straight into a leg hold. That looked really cool, uh, but Akiyama was able to escape. And then Endo comes back with a spitting torture rack bomb later on and goes up top and gets a beautiful shooting star press. But June rolls out of the way. Endo just absolutely eats shit on that shooting star press. He Akiyama go, gets the big running knee, but Endo kicks out of one. Uh, Akiyama gets a whole flurry of running knees to follow up. And then the exploder, but Endo kicks out at two. Uh, you know, with 30 minutes in at this point, they start trading these elbows, like both exhausted. Akiyama hits a headbutt. That was sick as hell. Followed up by the wrist clutch exploder, but Endo kicks out again. And then Akiyama finally hits the Sternus Dust Alpha. And that is the pin. The crowd seems stunned by that. 
But Endo survived everything, but finally couldn't survive that. Um, yeah, I thought, you know, even before I went back and watched it, the, the stuff, I, stuff I missed, you know, my, th- my thoughts were like, unless those four minutes I missed were the worst four minutes in the history of wrestling, this was an easy four and a half stars. Uh, I went back and watched and did not change my rating. I mean, you know, uh, incredible stuff here. Akiyama did a great job selling the leg. Uh, his big comeback just destroying Endo was so awesome. And Endo just, again, just takes a beating about as good as anybody. Just gets murdered here. Just won't stay down with all that fighting spirit. But then finally, uh, you know, Akiyama puts him down and ends his title reign. So, yeah, I thought that, I thought this was amazing. What did you, what did you think of this one? Uh, so... Between it being really late at night and, and being tired and the interruptions, I wasn't as high on this as first, but I watched it again today, and I, I'm going four and a half now, just watching the whole uh, the the whole thing uninterrupted and, and a little more alert. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the only thing I, I hate is I hate it when people are on the outside and they put people in submissions, but uh, not enough to like take any major uh, marks off the match or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that is what it is, you know, but yeah, I mean like four and a half, just really incredible match, uh, you know, up, definitely up there, uh, for my match of the year so far. I would, let me think about this. I would put it above, definitely put it above Suwama now, Yagi. Hmm. And it would be really close between this and Shingo Tanahashi and Shingo Cobb. I mean, obviously Naito Ibushi is above them because it's four and three quarters, but yeah, I'll have to think about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it stays on my list to the end. So, I mean, it, it was a really, really awesome match. It was much better than their Dio match, yes. which I thought was a little disappointing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, afterwards, Kenta Kobashi congratulates Akiyama, presents him with the KOD Openweight title belt. He goes to put it on him, but Akiyama declines because he says he's not willing to let uh, strap the belt until he avenges his other loss to DDT, and he calls out Higuchi because Higuchi famously beat him in that crazy three-minute match or whatever in the DO that was, like, one of the highlights of that tournament. Uh, so that, I am definitely here for that. So, uh, you know, but there we go. Uh, you know, just a really, really, um, definitely something I'm really excited for. I mean, those three minutes were like three of the best minutes of the year last year. So I'm assuming they'll go much longer this year, but I, I cannot wait for uh, Gamma and Higuchi. That's going to be incredible. So, uh, cyber fight going with the over fifties. Yeah. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, you know, him and Muto, I mean, I, it makes you wonder if they're going to do at least some kind of tag match against each other or something. So. Well, there's that press conference in the picture of the two belts. Yeah. And I, guess, I guess we'll see. Uh, as we're recording, we don't know, obviously, but you might you might already know when you're listening to this because it's coming up tomorrow, I think. So. Uh, like 2 or 3 a.m., yeah. I think, our time, yeah. Or whatever, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Akiyama afterwards, he says, Endo's fucking amazing. He says, let me borrow the belt for a little while. Um you know, and then he also makes a really funny line about the the uh, stream problems. He says, "Thanks everyone that came out. Thanks to those watching from home. Uh, I'm sorry the sh- the servers went down. Dino, what was that? The anal power supply, which was a, a throwback to the, the the tag match earlier. Make sure you have anal servers ready next time. <laughs> it's just a really, really, really funny line. But yeah, uh, thanks as always to uh, DDT English Update for help with the translations." Uh, they do an awesome job, as I always put over, DDT Pro underscore ENG. But yeah, I mean, like, just amazing, uh, really, really, like, amazing match here. Great pre, uh, post-match promo and a title match that I cannot wait to watch. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. I mean, I cannot, I don't know when they're going to book Akiyama Hakuchi. I don't think it's on the books yet, but I cannot wait for that match. So, very exciting. I don't know if you have any other thoughts before we move on. Uh, if you were to, uh, I know you're a betting person, so uh, would you bet that Muto or Akiyama has the longer reign? Akiyama. Yeah, that's what I would probably yeah. say. Uh, so then we move on to the semi main event here, which was the DDT Universal title. Yuki Ueno defeats Yuki Osakaguchi uh, by TKO with a rear naked choke sleeper in 1710 for his third defense. This fucking ruled too. Uh, we see during the hype video, Ueno had been training in BJJ with uh, Shinya Aoki leading up to the show, which ended up paying off in the finish. Uh, you know, Ueno goes after Sakaguchi's arm. Oh, I should mention, Yuki Sakaguchi had, like, the coolest entrance of all time. How cool was that entrance? It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, like, walks on the stage, uh, you know, the, the 
to his normal, like an extended version of his normal theme song. They did the whole intro, which they don't normally do for him, uh, to battle that honor humanity. And the other eruption members come out with him, and the theme song changes. She's such a cool fucking entrance. Uh, but yeah, Ueno starts targeting Sakaguchi's arm. Yukio comes back with his really hard kicks. We get some really neat mat wrestling that results in Yukio getting a triangle and nearly choking Ueno out just before the 10 minute mark. But Ueno is able to make the ropes. And then the spot of the match for me, Ueno gets this huge midair drop kick on a charging Sakaguchi. Such a cool spot. Like, just really wipes him out with this giant drop kick. And then Ueno eventually gets a choke on Sakaguchi on the mat. And then uh, Yukio goes to or goes out to give Ueno the win. A shock finish, but in a great way. Pays off the training stuff I mentioned. And Yukio does an amazing job selling, selling that he's out afterwards with the trainer even needing to look at him and stuff. So yeah, I went four and a quarter on this. Uh, I, I'm running out of, like, every DDT Big Show we review on this show, I end up having to say Yuki Ueno's underrated because I guess he's going to stay underrated because not a lot of people watch DDT. But he's, like, one of the best in the world at this point. I don't know what else to say. Like, he would make my top ten for sure. So. Uh, I went four and a quarter. Also, I thought this was an awesome... Well, I know that he was doing the BJJ training, but I still think this was this like the awesome little styles clash between like more traditional pro wrestler and a shoot styler. I actually thought uh, Sakaguchi had a chance of winning just based on that entrance alone. You know, it felt like important and, and some of the way that he was controlling the match early on uh, just so awesome. Um, and I going to probably watch it again because I've only rewatched the uh, main event from the show. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, match number six the Yuki Ino return match. Uh, Konosuke Takashida, Akito, Shuma Katsumata, and Yuki Ino of All Out, beating the Damnation team of Daisuke Sasaki, Soma Takao, Mad Polly, and Yuji Hino. Ino pins Polly with the spear in 2034. Uh, this was good. I went three and a half stars on this. You know, it started a little bit slow, but really picked up with a uh, big Sasaki Takashida exchange and then a great big boy battle with Hino and Ino. Uh, those two are going to meet in a singles match uh, in Nagoya on February 23rd, uh, in which they kind of tease afterwards too with Eno like yelling at him afterwards, which that could be really good. But yeah, um, you know, Eno basically, oh, there was like a big spot where Sasaki set a ladder up, you know, at ringside, like on this big slanted angle between a ring and a table on the floor. And Hino sent poor Shuma into it with a big slam, looked really nasty. Uh, and then Sasaki tried to break a chair over Eno's head, but Eno no sells it, goes wild on all of Damnation, like all by himself, before Mad Polly uh, finally cuts him off with a Fez press. But then everybody comes in to help him with Polly, and that leads to Eno hitting the two spears on Polly for the win. But yeah, this started slow, got pretty damn good by the end. I went three and a half stars on it, had a good time with it. Uh, yeah, a fun brawl. I thought Eno was the. Uh best uh guy in this match actually so i'm i'm excited to see the match against Eno. Uh, interesting little sort of um subversion of sort of some conventions but i guess it's ddt but Eno getting the big pin in his return match is not usually how yeah. traditionally things are booked and i like i i mean maybe they're just gonna try to give him a big push now i mean which i'd be down for and yeah he knows one of those guys it's like every time you see him you're like how is this guy not a bigger deal in like bigger companies it's he must be like a big asshole <laughs> or something like you know because like the fact that no one's ever like went with him is really besides like a zero one is, is really bizarre but i mean i guess he did help the kod title way back in the day now but it was a pretty short reign but uh you know i'm definitely excited to see i hope he sticks with det because i think he fits him well with damnation and you know uh i really don't think he has anywhere else to go last yeah at least you know, I mean, I mean, he could pop up and no again, which would be fine. But I think it's he's staying in cyber. Yeah, because he like he had a, a brief thing with all Japan too, and didn't last that long. So, uh, match number five: Hiroshima and Yuji Okabayashi beating Katsusada Higuchi and Yuki Onaya. Hiroshima pinning Naya with the Somato in thirteen thirty four. Uh, I seem to be lower on this than most people. I, I thought this was fine. You know, first five minutes or so was pretty damn dull. I thought, especially Naya working over Hiroshima. Uh, you know, it picked up after that, but you still have spots like, you know, Naya almost falling over trying to deliver a back chop to Hiroshima right before the finish. Uh, but then Hiroshima got like a counter Somato to a rolling Naya, followed by the real one. Uh, you know, I went two and three quarters. It just didn't didn't blow me away or anything. Uh, but, you know, 
It was fine. Uh, I went three and a quarter. Yeah, the Nia stuff was kind of uh, a little underwhelming, but like I thought the Higuchi versus Okabayashi stuff rocked. So I had to give it some marks for that. And afterwards, uh, Okabayashi looked like he wants to challenge for the KOD tag titles. Maybe he and, he and Arashima will do that. That could be cool. Uh, I mean, DT really loves to do that. The outsider with Hiroshima title shot, you know, those teams. So, uh, match number four, the... Okay, so this is when Universe died. And I did not have time to go back and watch this. So, I will have to go back and watch it at some point. But right now, I can't... I saw the ending of this okay. match. So, Super Delphin, Chris Brooks, and Maki Ito beating Mao, Keigo Nakamura, and Mirai Mayumi. When Ito pinned Nakamura at the uh, Kani Kani Flying Big Head in 1607, um, you know it was it looked fun while I was while I was watching. It. I mean, I, I love you know uh, Mariah Mayumi is like one of the most uh, you know under the radar Joshi out there because you you know not a lot of people watch Tokyo Joshi, but she and she's pretty new, but like she is so fucking good and like especially for her level of um, you know her level of uh, like experience i mean she is so good so you know it's definitely uh it's definitely a a match that I, i'm gonna go back and watch i just didn't have time to do it before you know before i watched uh before i had to record the show so my impressions of the match was it started a little slow delphin doesn't really do much throughout the match even though i love him uh but things sort of get going a lot better in uh, later on with like some stuff between uh, Chris Brooks and Mao, especially uh, Ito's awesome as she always is. Uh, so I thought this really picked up towards the end. And, you know, I mean, you know, you got like all your spots, like at one point, you know, Ito bangs her head into the ring post and starts arguing with it and everything like that. So yeah, it was really fun. Uh, then we have the, uh, match number three. Speaking of really fun here, uh, the Joshi match with Saki Akai and Maya Yukihi defeating Sari Ano, uh, Sayori Ano, and Miyako Matsumoto. Saki pinned Matsumoto with the Rookie Award in 1052. That's her crossbody. Uh, but yeah, so Maya Yukihi and Sayori Ano are mostly from Ice Ribbon. Uh, Miyako is from Gaki no Fuji, the other DDT Joshi brand. Uh, but yeah, this was this was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, just the, a lot, some of it was comedy and stuff. Um, you know, a lot of it was comedy, I guess, especially with Miyako in there. But like, you know, the the stuff that was, uh, you know, the, that was just them wrestling was like, you know, some pretty damn good wrestling. And like, there was a moment between Saki and Miyako that was just way stiffer than you'd expect from these two. Like Miyako, like I said, mostly a comedy wrestler, but she started really firing up with these slaps before Saki just like grabbed this much smaller woman by the hair and just like slapped her once in the face really hard. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, definitely a, a, a moment that stood out to me. Uh, and then Miyako, like, turned on her own partner, like, just kind of ran in and hit her, even though she had plenty of time to stop. And then she made, like, a big human pile and tried to pose on top of all of them. But, you know, there was no referee to make any kind of count. And then everybody in the match basically had enough of her shit. And, you know, Sayori just basically let Saki pin her. Uh, I went three and a quarter. Very enjoyable here. And afterward, uh, the, 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 the post-match was probably the highlight, where, like, Saki and Maya invite uh, Ano to come pose with them. But the moment Miyako tries to lay down in front of them and get in the picture, too, they all immediately get stone-faced and just get up. I just thought that was just such great, like, comedic timing there. It was so great. Uh, I went three and a half. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I thought the comedy was weaved in perfectly. And, yeah, I mean, I thought uh, this is my... First time seeing, I've seen all of them at least a couple of times, except for Miyako. And uh, I loved how she managed to basically generate go away heat, but like good go away heat, if that makes sense. Yeah, indeed. Uh, then we have match number two, which was the KOD eight man tag team titles Shinde Aoki, Super Sass Nango Machine, Antonio Honda, and Kazuki Hirata beating Sinshiro Takagi, Dan Shokudino, Tor Awashi, and Makoto Oishi. Here to Pintakagi at the Miracle One Shot Cradle in 1249. Uh, these are usually the 10 man tag titles, but as a joke, they were reduced to the 8 man tag titles because of the current social situation. You know, we need uh, social distancing and all that. So 10's too many. But yeah, uh, the big joke here was the staff was like, uh, I guess, blasting the music at full volume for Hirata, and it blew some fuses. 
And, you know, Hirata got very sad. The power went out and they couldn't dance anymore. He was like, I'm not destined to dance. But Dino says, stop, Hirata. Uh, you know, look at all these fans that came out for you. Don't give up. I'm not giving up. And we end up making a huge human extension cord to reach the building's power using uh, Danshoku's anal power, which is the thing Akiyama referenced in the main event. So here it took a dance. It only lasts a few minutes, though. And we end up needing anal power from Aoki, too. And Dino has to stick his whole face in his butt for some reason <laughs> to carry the current. Uh, so this was something. Definitely something. And, you know, Takagi tries to jump him with a Larry afterward, but Hirata ends up cradling him with a pen. Uh, the anal power stuff was funny, so I definitely, uh, not going to complain about that. Anna, do you have any thoughts? Um, so sometimes I sort of just have DDT undercards in the background and wait for the main events. But since, you know, I was coming on here, I, you know, paid attention and everything and, uh, you know, this was there. Uh, not for me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, the ne- opener was the Young Boy match. Mizuki Watase and Hideki Okatani defeating Yusuke Okada and Toru Kojima. Watase submitted Kojima the crab hold in 830. Um, so you have here, basically, you know, Yusuke Okada, of course, was Akiyama's protege in all Japan. He moved to DDT, which ruined the all three of the traditional men's promotions of Japan have a guy named Okada thing. So that's unfortunate, but at least he's able to wake up a day each day without knowing he's going to lose a match. So uh, that's nice, I guess. But yeah, I went with three stars here. Nothing blow away, but everybody worked hard. Uh, exactly what you want from an opening young boy tag. And the main thing they're pushing here is the Okada versus Watase feud uh, as like who's Akiyama's real protege now kind of thing. So uh, I went through in a quarter. I was excited to see this open the show. Uh, this is actually one of my most uh, uh, anticipated matches on the show because I wanted to see Okada because I actually haven't watched any uh, DDT since the DO finals. So I hadn't seen any Okada in DDT. Uh, so I want, really wanted to see that. And uh, he did not disappoint. And um, yeah, I'm kind of really excited to where this feud goes. Like, is he going to, is going to end up, joining Junritsu or is he going to like be a lone wolf and sort of, you know, sort of spurn Akiyama? It's kind of curious where it goes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think cause like, he didn't come out there, like you said, right. In the main event. So I yeah. Say... Like, you know, you could, it could set it up where he's just like, Oh, whatever, you know, like I'm go away. Like I'll go out on my own, which might not well i mean he sort of did that at all japan as an angle when he left evolution in that <laughs> tank but you know i think they're not going to do anything like that horrible to him now in gdt so it, there's still you know could be a good story here so there you go uh, i would say this is a really good show i mean you know the, a lot of stuff that was you know good to go, good to great and then the main event was like the top two matches were both like awesome so you know Another great show here. It was a good couple days for a uh, cyber fight. That is for sure. Absolutely. I think they've got a huge amount of momentum coming out of this. Yep. Uh, now, I mean, I suppose the interesting thing is like, what do you think eventually GDT is going to get English commentary? That'd be great if they did. I mean, yeah, I would hope so. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. Because it's sort of interesting that even like Tokyo Joshi Pro got it before DDT did. Yeah, for sure. Because they are still a smaller promotion based on the amount they draw. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, So really quickly, let's talk about some upcoming stuff in DDT. Uh, The next big show, February 23rd at Nagoya. Uh, The main event is Higuchi and Yukio Sakaguchi defending the KOD tag team titles against Konosuke Takashita and Mao. Uh, Then we also have a six-man tag team title match with uh, Akito, Hirata, and Shota defending against Shinshiro Takagi, Hiroshima, and Dan Shogudino. The Yuji Hino versus Yuki Ino singles match we talked about. Uh, and also, uh, a, a kind of interesting eight-man tag, um, Strong Hearts, Shima, T-Hawk, Linda Man, and Irie against Jun Akiyama, Makoto Oishi, uh, Mizuki Watase, and Hideki, Hideki Okatani. So, some cool stuff there. Definitely going to remember to check that oh, out. Oh, that sounds really yeah. good. Yeah, I thought I kind of thought that Strong Hearts had sort of faded away from DDT, but I guess Yeah, they not. still show up sometimes. Uh, and then the 28th, February 28th at Corican, Into the Fight, 
that is the next Cork and Hall show. We have two matches so far. Uh, the Iron Man Heavy Middleweight title, Five Way. The Young Bucks autobiography, Killing the Business, that is the cha- current champion, versus Kazuki Hirata versus Dan Shokudino versus Antonio Honda versus Saki Akai. So there you go. Uh, and the other match. Is this your most awaited Young Bucks <laughs> match in some time? For sure. Uh, and then the main event, or I don't, actually, I don't know if it's the main event, it's the only other match so far. Uh, the DDT Extreme title, Shuma Katsumata defending against Mao. So there you go. The, two, the DT Sonic Club explodes uh, in Cork and Hall. We'll see if they... I mean, they're going to add something else, I'm sure. We'll see if... If they add Akiyama versus Gucci, that'll be awesome. But I haven't heard anything yet. So might be it might be a match for March or something. Uh, but yeah, I guess that'll do it. Some really cool stuff coming out of DT. Cool stuff coming out of Noah. New Japan. I hope they get back on track. I mean, after those two shows. We'll see how Catherine Tech goes, I guess. Uh, anything you want to plug, Gerard, before I wrap things up here? Well, I uh, just gonna say thanks for having me on, and we made it. We did make it. That wasn't bad going all those four shows, and to end my long week of uh, wrestling watching. So that was a uh, pretty good in hindsight. Yeah, we got through them without uh, going three hours. So that's good. Yeah. Okay, so I'm on at Twitter at Gerard Detroit, and you can read all my coverage of all Japan at VoicesOfWrestling dot com. Go. Uh, of course, you can follow us on Twitter at Wrestle Omakase Wrestling One and Fat. Uh, come check out the Patreon, which I forgot to plug at the start of the show. Uh, it is patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Uh, we did a new five matches episode exclusively on the Patreon with myself and WH Park from Post Wrestling. So that was a lot of fun. We covered like Puro matches from four different decades. So definitely check that out. The Ted Ruin and Stan Hansen team, little known about, we covered that. Uh, a Noah match that was really good that no one talks about. We covered that. Some really cool stuff on that show. Uh, Toyota against Aja Kong. So yeah, that's up there right now for you. That going up this past week, and then uh, we're doing a one match series with uh, you know these patron submitted matches. We've done uh, a battle arts match so far, a DDT match uh, with Takashita against Yoshihiko. I'm taking credit for that battle arts match. I have oh, you to. submitted for it. That's right. It... Yeah, because it got such a good response, yeah. so I will take all the credit People for it. People love that one. And then we did a Bushi versus AJ Styles from New Japan. And then I think a Joshi tag with LCO is next, so that'll be going up this week. Uh, and then next week, so we're taking, we're taking a week off on the free feed. Going to do that from time to time when <laughs> just because uh, I talk a lot now on the microphone. That's all it comes down to. Uh, so we're taking a week off on the free feed. Uh, but we, there will be a new episode ex- exclusively on the Patreon, uh, our 200th episode. So if you want to hear that, uh, it'll be our first ever New Japan Retro Roulette. Uh, myself and my buddy Quinlan, Quinlan returning to the show for the first time in a while, we're going to do random matches from New Japan's anniversary shows. So we're going to do a little bit different than, than the WCW Retro Roulettes, mostly to avoid like undercard tags that don't look interesting. But we're still going to put like a lot of matches in there and you know do six random ones. We'll see what we get. Uh, so definitely going to be a lot of fun with that. So, you know, I hope you get excited for the upcoming anniversary show, uh, covering some of the stuff over the previous like decade of anniversary shows. So it should be a lot of fun there. And again, that will be exclusively on the Patreon. So patreon.com slash wrestling omakase, only $5. Uh, definitely check that out if you want to hear me next week. If you're going to stick with the free feed here, we'll be back in two weeks uh, for another pack show where we're going to have to cover four shows again. Uh, New Japan Castle Attack, 27th and 28th. All Japan's 20, uh, February 23rd Korokin, uh with Suwama defending against, uh, God, Sato, right? Kohei Sato. Your, your boy Kohei, yeah, your boy, Kohei Sato, Sato, Sato. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why like my brain went Hino for a second. I'm like, no, that's not right. Uh, and then Noah, February 24th Korokin that doesn't have anything booked so far. So we'll probably do that. We'll have to wait and see what's on it, though. But definitely those two Castle Attacks and definitely the All Japan Korokin. Uh, so that'll be back in two weeks with that. Next week on the Patreon, patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Meantime, thank you as always for listening, and I will see you next time. You heard that safe drivers get rewarded with Snapshot from Progressive, so you went online to check it out. But then you saw an ad for a vintage baseball cap, and now you find yourself checking the stats of that team's second baseman in 97, wondering why his stolen base total dropped after his rookie season. Wonder how much his rookie card is worth. Yes, they said it was easy to save money with Snapshot from Progressive, but they forgot about the rest of the Internet. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California, North Carolina, or from all agents.